Okay, here's your info bag. The citation for speed. Got you going 57 and a 35. I wrote you down for a 50. Um, you have five days and no more 14 to contact Santa Clara Justice Court. It shows right there in that little box right there. And then just has a phone number right there. Okay, you have any questions for me? Okay, just slow down for me, please. Thank you. On August 30th of 2023, this brave 12-year-old boy escaped Jody Hildebrand's house. She was a friend of his mother, Ruby Frankie, and the two of them were practicing religious extremism. Some say it was the beginning of an alleged cult, and they were inflicting the worst punishments on Ruby Frankie's two youngest children. This happened in Ivan's, Utah. So not only can you imagine how hot it must have been, this little boy is wearing only socks. Just think about that as he's walking from Jody Hildebrand's house to get help from neighbors, knowing that his life could be in danger if Jody Hildebrand caught him again, because this was not the first time that he escaped. And he knew he didn't have many houses, doors to knock on. There were only three finished houses in the area at the time. So the footage you see here was the first neighbor's house and he was unfortunately not home at the time. And then this little boy walked to another neighbor's house and you'll see him in this case file footage, patiently waiting for someone to answer the door. Thankfully, that neighbor did answer and was able to save these children's lives when he called the police and they came over and they investigated and rescued this 12 year old boy and his nine year old sister from two completely delusional, demented and evil women. This video is a case file that I've made for you, which includes the ring cam footage, the 911 call, all the body cam footage and police interviews. It also includes all the jail calls that the state of Utah has made public so far. And if you want to see something specific, just check out the pinned comment or the description box or hover over the video to see the chapters known as timestamps. If you didn't know, Ruby Frankie and Jody Hildebrand took a plea deal and both are serving a minimum of four years in prison and a maximum of 30 years in prison. The parole board will decide how long each of them spends there and I really hope it's the maximum. As always, this is true crime, so these cases do come with a trigger warning. This one in particular definitely does because it's extremely distressing to see what these adults did to these children. Please note that this content is for adults only. Viewer discretion advised. If you haven't yet, hit the subscribe, like and share. Nine one one. The address of your emergency. Okay, and the phone number you're calling from. Tell me exactly what's happened. I just had a twelve-year-old boy show up here at my front door asking for help, and he's uh, said he just came from a neighbor's house, and we know there's been problems at this neighbor's house. He's emaciated. He's got tape around his legs. He's hungry and he's thirsty. Okay. Is he? Is your door locked? No, I'm sitting outside with him on the on the front patio. Okay. And he asked us to call the police. What's so he's name? very afraid. What's your last name? He's 12 years old. Yes. Okay. And can you ask him his date of birth? Can you tell me your birthday? Okay. And um, is are the neighbors out of their home, or is anybody looking for him that you can see? Uh, no. We are homes are far enough away. Uh, I'm not sure. How did you get out of the house? Uh, 
porch. He went out through the porch. He says he just left through the porch at the neighbor's house. Um, her name is Jody Hildebrand, and she lives two doors up the street. Out here in Cayenne, the houses are far apart. Yeah, out here in the houses are far apart, so he walked just under a block to get to our house. He, he rang my doorbell and asked me to call the police. Does he seem to be under the influence of drugs or alcohol? I don't think so, but he's very thirsty and... Uh, need an ambulance? <laughs> I don't think he needs an ambulance. I'll let the cops decide that, but his ankles are taped up, and he won't tell us why. Okay. But he has duct tape around each ankle. Yeah, there's sores around them. I think the a good chance he's been... Uh, he also said... Oh, and he has them around his ankles. I mean, his wrists as well. Okay, this boy has been... He <laughs> kid has obviously been, I think he's been, he's been detained, he's been, he's obviously covered in wounds. Okay. Let's get the paramedics headed over that way, okay? Oh, well, that's a good idea, too. Let's see, um, has he told you where his mom or dad are? I haven't asked him that. Hmm? Yeah. You know what, Mommy? And I really got these. Yeah, I'm sure that that doesn't matter, son. Do you know where your mom and dad are? Well, actually, I don't know where my mom is, but I do know where my dad is. He's not anywhere here. No, no, no. Nowhere. Okay. No, he doesn't seem to. He says he knows where his mom is, but. Uh, he doesn't know where his dad is. That's correct. I think you know where his dad is. Is his mom home? He doesn't live around here. He just says he doesn't live around here. Okay. Is his mom yeah, in the area? And is your mom around here? Have you seen her lately? He doesn't know where she is right now. Does he know his mom's name? What's your mom's name? Ruby Frankie. Ruby Frankie is his mom's name. Okay. How do you spell the last name? F R A K E. F R A N K E. Okay. And does she live in the area? No, I'm not sure where she lives. He's uh, he's trying to help us, but. That's okay. We don't want to stress him out too much. The officers will go over all these questions with him anyway. I just want to stay on the phone with you until we get some help there, okay? Yeah, um, yeah. What's your name? My name is... Um, can you ask him if any other children were in the home he came from? Okay. Um, was there any other kids up at Jody's house? Besides. Anybody else? No. I, I was uh, yeah, this is the 30th of, uh, or excuse me, the 29th of August. It'll be the 30th of August. Today. 10 and 14, and they're, they're still at this house. Ask, um, it, it, are they tied up as well? Um, what's the uh, deal with, are they, um, are they, are they being held? Are they, are they, do they have wounds on them as well? Nothing bad going on with them. Okay. Okay. So they're, they're able to walk around the house and everything? And, well, okay. He says everything's fine with them. 
grain of salt. Okay. He says he, uh, what's happened to him is his fault. That's not a problem. That's sad to hear. They're coming to you as quick as they can, okay? Okay, yeah. Really yeah I just want to make sure. He's fine. If I got him sitting here, my wife, he got him water and something to, giving him something to eat because he's really, he's hungry and uh, I think they're young men. He's, had, he's here in his stocking feet. Uh, so he, he escaped. <laughs> well, I'm glad that he was able to make it to you way. and he could be safe. They should just be pulling up now. Let me know when they're with you, okay? Will do. I hear a car, but they're not coming on the driveway. You did good. Enjoy that banana, okay? Hmm. Yeah, he just he did the right thing. a few seconds ago, so he might be waiting for his partner. I'm not sure. Is Jody up there right now? Yes. Okay. Jody Hildebrand is up there right now. Okay. So she may come looking for him here soon, but uh, he's not going to, obviously. All right, we need the cops here as soon as possible. I'm just asking where he is now. Yeah, she's a, uh, she's a bad lady. We didn't realize how bad. asking where he is. Well, it sounds like he's making a phone call real quick um, to his sergeant. He is going to head up. Okay. All right. Well, if we have to take him inside the house, we will. I'm just, we're just sitting outside right now because we have chairs out here and it was convenient. That's okay. Um, if anything, he's sitting out down your driveway and keeping an eye on the house. So if that's where you feel safe, that's where the child feels safe, then let's just stay where you're at. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're doing this. Yes. Does he have anything with him? But, uh, no, he's wearing a long sleeve shirt and shorts, and uh, it's uh, way too big for him. Um, Can you tell me um, what color the shirt and shorts are? Okay, the... Uh, the ambulance is here. Okay. So. Are they with you? No, they're they're just not getting out of the truck. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll go ahead and I'll let you go. Then you did a great job. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, mate. Bye. Answer the door right now, but if you'd like to leave a message, you can do it now.
on you. Who did him? You're not in trouble with me, okay? We're just trying to figure out what's going on. Our main focus right now is you, okay? Who put the ropes on you? Supposed to help you what? So what's your name? Where is like, she Jody. At? Hildebrand. So she said she lives over here. I was like, all right. It's like, well, I'm just on my, the phone with my sergeant right now. Like, we're going to try to find the kid for you. We need to identify that house. And if there's two other kids there, we need to go do a security sweep of that house. 12X1711, can you head over here to the road? Sergeant told me I'm mean, just get a few pictures of your favorite friends.
Police officers, open up! Step out. Oh, I have. I have my turn. That's great. Step out of the house. No, I'm not going to step out. Step out of the house. Step out of the house. Whoa, 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 whoa! We're just going to step out. Turn bail phone. Wait a minute. How do you come to my house? Right there. They're going into my house. Just have a seat right there. Do you have a search warrant? Have a seat right there. Do you have a search warrant? Have a seat right there. I'll explain everything after. Have a seat right there. Do you have a search warrant, sir? Control 12 x can you hold the air? We're searching the house. I can tell you what's in the house. Okay. Just have a seat right there for me. Do you have a search warrant? We'll explain it after this. You can't just come into my house without a search warrant. We'll explain everything after this, ma'am. Okay. Well, that's one of the reasons why we're here. So we'll explain after everything's done, after we clear the house and make sure everything's fine in But there. why are you coming into my house without a we'll search warrant? We'll explain it after this. But that doesn't make sense. You come into my house and do what you want, and then you tell me you don't have a no, warrant? No, we'll explain why we did. But don't you have to have a warrant? Not at this moment, we don't. We're here on exigent circumstances, and I'll explain it after this, after my sergeant and the officer are done clearing the house. Is there anybody else in the house? Yes. Two kids? There's a little girl. Just one? She's right over here. Okay. How old is she? She'll be 10 next week. Okay. And she's on this side? Mm hmm I have Airbnb guests over there. Probably scared them to death. Okay. And they're on this side of the house then? They're right over there. She's over here. Can you get through the house that way? Yes, they just okay. have to go right there. There's no other kids besides her? No. What's her name? Should be off to where are you at? Should be off to the left, right in there. Is it the main bedroom? It's right there. How do you get there from the inside? Walk around the corner. There's a little hall, and it's the first. It's just around the, the corner, right. down the hall. Second door to the right.
Like there's looks like there's two. There's two. There's two. There's two. Look like two. There's there's only one. Well, who's this at the door then? Oh, that's never mind. Sorry, that was one of the officers. I thought it was two. Should just be one. Just one. Just one. Our uh, Airbnb people were here. They're at the Capscom out there. Oh, okay. There's only Eve. What's that? There's only Eve. They're saying there's another person. There's not. Okay.
renting a room to somebody? Airbnb. Like an Airbnb? Where is that at? Is it the basement? No. There's just a room on the outside there? Is that Can you access that room from inside here, inside the house? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can? Okay. Yeah, I have guests there. I don't assume they're there. You know where they're from? I think they said Salt Lake. Salt Lake? Adam, I know you have a flight to catch, so they're just... Well, so they're, they're in your home because you lied to them about... Yeah, them. I've got a police officer standing right here. Okay. So, I don't want you to miss your flight, so... Well, I'm not going to miss my flight. I'm, I'm okay for a minute. Okay. Have they found her yet? Yeah, yeah, they have you. I think there's somebody else in the house. There's not.
there are three children that are supposed to be in this house? There's one that's here. One that's here? There's not three children that are supposed to be here in this home? No. Yeah. I have one officer standing right here with me. Um, there's about six of them. I don't know where it is. I know they found her. I don't know if it left her there. I don't know.
Yeah. 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 Thank you.
might be outside with the right. Airbnb people. Oh, I, are they still or did they go? I don't know. Okay. He had them somewhere on the side. Lieutenant. I have a question for you. Yeah. You have a room downstairs that has a safe wheel on the front. Mm -hmm. How do we get access to that to ensure that there's no one else in this home? Adam. And then you don't have to tell me the code. If you just want to open it, we're going to go in and make sure that nobody's else there, and then we'll sit down and have a conversation after that as far as why we're here. Okay. That makes sense? I, yes, okay. it makes sense. And I, Do you want to open it then? I don't know if I have the code. I've, Does he have the code no. and he can tell you the code, and that's just between you two? No. That thing has been locked for a couple of years, and I would have to call whatever. Okay. Is that a panic room or a room where... It's a room. With a toilet, with a sink. A toilet and a sink, and you don't know the code. I haven't used it. Okay. All right. You got to call the safe company. Is that how you have to I call? I assume them? that's where I have to call. Okay. This hasn't been at the top of my priority list. Yeah.
Yeah, just a minute. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But I think if I call the, the whatever it's called, it's called Liberty Safe. But I don't know if they're going to know because I'm the one that said it. But that was six years ago. speaker. Okay, hold on. Okay, you're on speaker. Do what? Yeah, no, I can talk to him on the phone. Okay. Is that your attorney? Yes. Okay. Hello, sir. Hey. Hey, it's Lieutenant Studley. Hey, so we're not going to have any uh, conversation over the phone. We'll probably do that in person. Is there a time that we can sit down and meet? Okay. Could we do Friday? Absolutely. What time Friday works for you? Um, well, could we do in the afternoon? You, you tell me what time I will be available. Um, Jody, what 4 o'clock on Friday work? Yeah. You want Jody there, I presume? Yes. Not, not yet, but I, I can do that with, with you on the phone. But again, there won't be any dialogue. Um, we received a report of an emaciated juvenile um, that had duct tape around his uh, extremities that was asking for food and water. And based on that information, there are other people in the home, so we're ensuring that there is nobody else in the same condition. So under that X and shape C, we've entered the home. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Okay. And 
where, where, where were we? Our police department is 55 North Main Street in Ivins. Did you hear that, Adam? I did, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and Jody, um, Officer, thank you. I don't know if you're still on the phone. Yeah, no, we're here. Absolutely, I will walk away and you are on your own. Alright. That's on here. All I know is that some needs to go draft a search one. So that's probably fine. I just wanted to have Toke to do that based on his info. He got her. He's straight in there.
I'm at the front door. Captain, really captain. Yes, really captain. He's uh Hey, you still have your attorney on the phone? Okay. I just want to advise you of our intentions. Um, it seems uh, like there's a room we can't get into. We're getting some conflicting information. We're going to go draft a search warrant. We'll be right back, okay? What's that? What does he mean a search warrant? I'm just going to get a warrant from the judge. I don't understand what that means. They'll explain it to you when they give it to you. Okay. Getting conflicting information from. I don't know. I don't know who they talked to since we've been here. Like I said, well, the reason mm -hmm. Lieutenant Stelly said the reason why we're here is to make sure everybody was okay. Nice. Um, that everybody was. I mean, the condition we found Russell in. Um, the search warrant, I imagine, is going to be some do a more in-depth search of the house. Um, right now, it's just safety and security of the people. Got it. Make sure they're okay. No, I see your position. No. That's why I'm crying. Yes. Yeah. I see why you think this is an issue. Yeah. It's sad. Yeah. I noticed you got a giant bug, though, back there. Yeah, it's on my to-do list to sweep that off the plant. The guy came and did a spray. Spray, and like three days later, I had bugs everywhere. All dead. Not work. Yeah. That one came a couple days later. I seen that. Made sure that it was that yeah. was dead. That way. That was a little intimidating. Yeah. You can probably sit on the couch so you're not out here in the sun. Okay. okay. If you guys want to go sit on the bathroom. Absolutely. <laughs> Just have to make sure no I hope so. Otherwise, mine's still blocking my address. From my, like my address, I pulled it up, right? And I drove it over. And it's like, I'm the last car at the very end right there. Oh, damn. I <laughs> think. I, I rolled up, and the lady's like, oh, they're down the street. I'm like, what the heck? Why are you on the car? <laughs> yeah, I think he went down and grabbed mine. Mine was blocking on the road, so. Yeah. I wonder if I was lying. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I wonder if I'm going to walk <laughs> That's what I would do. That's what I would do. 
Just a patrol car now. Oh. <laughs> I should have more bracelets in my car. Somewhere. Must miss that stuff. I'll just have a seat on the couch.
So then, Tony, we're just, they're in the process of just writing our war right now. We're just kind of waiting on that, just so that, you know, that, that process. Mm -hmm. That's why we're just sitting around. Okay. What is the difference? Huh? What is the difference in a war? The difference is, is the reason we came in without a war, with what we call exigent circumstances, where we're worried about other children and things like that. Um, and then, once we once we've kind of solidified that and, and we don't have anything, then we have to write a warrant to be able to continue with our investigation on the home. Does that make sense? So the the first entrance is just is just for well safe or safe safety. The second is if we want to gather any evidence or anything like that, we have to have a warrant. If we want, like we need to get into that safe to verify no one's in there, so we have to have a warrant. We end up having to cut it off if we can't figure out how to get in there without doing that. You know, I mean, we don't want to cause damage, but sometimes we're just we're we're faced with that if we can't figure out how to get in there. So things like that. So. Well, the children's mother is going to do it. What's that? The children's mother is going to do it. Okay, great. That, that's great. We're from from Utah, Canada. from where? Utah, Canada. Oh, Utah, Canada. Okay, so she's going to be a few hours. Okay. There's only two kids. There's just the two kids? Okay. Just a boy and a girl? Right. And the boy is here? We're just staying with me for a little while. Huh? We're just staying with me for a little while. Okay. What's the boy's name? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah.
Mm-hmm. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.
Mm-hmm. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thank you.
Mm-hmm. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thank you.
Mm-hmm. <laughs>
Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not <laughs> not
Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just got there or in the ambulance. First observed the kid, he was sitting on the chair, had the um, duct tape and plastic around uh, his ankles. And then he had a long sleeve shirt on, and then we pulled his sleeves up and he had duct tape and clear plastic underneath the sleeves on both wrists. And then uh, medical got there. They started cutting his, cutting the stuff off him. And then you can see like the, the dark around his ankles. And it, it you could smell it, the, the flesh. It's underneath the tape, as soon as they took it off, you can, even outside, you can smell. You can smell the, the flesh. And then um, the transport, or put him in the ambulance. I went in there. Um, they started cutting more off of it. You can see the wounds on the back of his ankles, around the front of his ankles. Um, and then on his wrists as well. And. Um, the wounds around his ankles were dark and, um, like, I don't know, like wet looking, I guess, from the moisture underneath it. Yeah, he said, he said, uh, he was tied on the ground with a rope. That's where the wounds came from. Yeah, with ropes on all four of his extremities. And that's where the wounds came from. And then um, they put the they put yeah they put cayenne pepper mixed with uh, honey. He said on the wounds, and then covered that with the plastic saran wrap and then the duct tape over the wounds. Yeah. 
and then that's what we cut off was that. Yeah, they dressed the wounds. Um, some of the wounds when I was in there, um, when they went to go um, peel it, they thought it was some of the dressing. It was actually his skin that was peeling. Is this you in here? I'm Sergeant Tobler. What's your name? Just I just have one. Where's your sister at? Contact one. You okay? Huh? You doing okay? You don't want to talk to me? Yeah, that's okay. Can you come with me though? We got Jody out here. You know Jody? She's outside with us. You, you take your time, but I'm in a hurry. I'm a police officer. Did you know that? I don't mean to hurt you at all. You doing okay? Are you scared? Yeah? You're okay. Do you need help? You want to come with me? No? I'm not going to hurt you. Promise. See this right here? It's a badge. It tells me I don't hurt people. I'm just here to make sure you're okay. You're in no way in any trouble. I'm not here to hurt you. I just want to make sure you're okay. I get you if you're scared. I would be too. Okay. You want to come with me? One zero one to do double eight. It's okay if I just sit here with you. We don't have to say anything if you don't want to. Sit here with you. Hey, no food? <laughs> oh, it's fantastic. Okay, you want to have You can eat. There it goes.
Is your mother looking at you? You the only one that's here. That's all you.
So can we carry you from there? We helped your brother, and we got him some help too. And that's what we want to do for you. That's we want to get you some help too. We are safe. We will not hurt you, and we won't do anything to hurt you.
Feels good in the air. So, hey, Ruby, after this time, I know you have to sedate your arm to team. But I'm going to be taking you back to the police department. Okay, so I'm going to need to pop up. See if I can fit through here. You want to put it on one of our vehicles? Yeah, you want to. Okay, just place your hand behind your back for me. Perfect. And then, right now, I can put a finger in each of these, okay? And I'm just going to double off this so they don't tighten up on you on the way out there. Where's your car? It's out there. Yeah. I'm about by the command. Um, you don't have anything on you that I should know about, correct? Any weapons, anything that we're going to find. Before we put you in a police vehicle, we need to search your person to make sure you don't have anything on you. Is there anything you have on you? Okay, I'm going to search you before we put you in his car. That's just protocol, so I'm just going to have you step right over here, and then just widen your waist, widen your stance. Yep, perfect. Are you wearing a bra? Okay, I'm just going to go like this through and make sure you don't have anything. You said you're not wearing a bra? Okay. Is that just like a tank top under here? Okay. Lift up your hair. Okay. All right, you're just gonna walk with Officer Hines. No problem. And then, hey, Hines. You want me this way or that way? Yeah. Okay. And then, if you want to go down the downstairs, yeah. into the interview room downstairs. Sounds good. Thank you going you. down, or I'm going down? I appreciate it. I was going to ask you to come to my car, but I'm leaving now. So we're good. Yeah. It's still on. Thank you. Okay. Hey, but uh, hold on. Well. Uh, yeah, I got you. Just so we can tell them who we're taking down there. Ruby? Okay. Go this way. My view. Sorry, one. Yeah, Captain. Oh, uh, yeah, he told me. She told me transfer it down, and then she'll meet me okay, there. Yeah. Take me your car, then yeah. I'll, 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 I'll. Appreciate it. 
Ruby, what's your last name? Just so I could tell them I'm transferring. Okay. Control to X13. I'll be transferring Ruby to number 12. I'll give you my beginning here in a minute. Yeah, I'll turn it on. My fight song at this moment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, pizza. I'll bring a box to 12. Control traffic search in beginning 7.0.9. Thank you. 
What's up, Sarge? Hey, brother, do you still have custody of that one girl? Yeah. So we need her cell phone. We have a one that we just collect. We were okay. going to kind of do that. Sorry. If you want to grab that. Too. It's actually her, her, her purse is down, is in the room that where she was holding, still in there. Do you know what room? Like, I don't know where you guys were at. Um, we were in S. Uh, SLT or captain or somebody they knew what room I was in So you know where the stairs were outside we're in that room right next to the stairs we were in All the captain What's that? So the, it should be a pink purse I'm trying to remember what that was So if you go in the kitchen, you turn right. Yeah, so I'm here. Okay. There's no pink person in the room though. Uh -huh, it's in the front room on the kitchen table, uh, on the table by the window with the three chairs. Okay, not this room. Um, Control Topics 1323, copy Andy. Okay, so. I'm in the room. Seven four point two. Yeah, we might have to come back to the first. Well, it's seriously. It's, I put it back on the counter. It should be on that it's like a rank triangle Love table count. with the three chairs set underneath. Yeah, I, we just walked to the whole top of the house. There's no. That's the uh, okay. I, I was upstairs, so I don't know where you guys are. I'll come up and I'll come back and grab it after they get back here. You guys got it? Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Sorry, brown hand I thought it was pink. Alright. Thanks, sir. Bye. Come on up, please. We'll go that way. Close that door. What's that? Downstairs in the interview room. So I could have gone that way, but I appreciate opening the door. We'll take these stairs right here.
and we'll let down this hole. This next one right right here. Right here. And we'll go ahead and I can remove those cuffs right here. Go to the and remove them. This way, yeah. Okay, go ahead and have a seat. Let me light on. Okay,
Thanks. Your silly comes out in my office. What's that? Huh? You can tell him I'm in my office. What'd you say about your office? Uh, just tell Sylvie I'm in here when he comes out. If he's. Oh, okay. Because he's going to do interviews with me. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, you want your cuff back? She is definitely not a talker. She's not? Maybe no. no, Even if I ask her a name okay. or just like, let me ask him about things, she looks at me and go. I know. Tell me the names. What's that? Tell me the names. Really? Yeah, I'm very excited. Was this your water? I'm going to. It's yours if you want it. We'll say that. Uh -huh. We also have snacks if you need anything to eat. So I know I introduced myself to you earlier, but my name is Detective Bates, and this is Sergeant Tobler. We're just here to talk to you about kind of a few things involving your kids. So first, are you do you live down here or? Or do you live up north? Do you want to talk to me about where you live or how many kids you have? So we just spoke with your husband and he said you guys have six kids. Are those all together? Are those all your kids? I can wait all day. So it's up to you if you want to talk to us about what's going on. Would you feel more comfortable talking to one of us? Maybe you want me to take a step out if you want. Or if you feel more comfortable talking to him, I can step out. I'll wait till I have a lawyer. Okay. So you don't want to talk to us at all. Do you want to answer that? Are you, you don't want to talk to us about anything? So, yeah, this, this is just your chance to tell us we're just trying to get your side of the story. Um, so it's your chance to do that. But it's up to you. We're just going to talk. And, I mean, I'm not asking any criminal questions. If you don't want to talk to us, just let us know and we'll, we'll be done. I've already told you. That you want a lawyer? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Easy enough. Thank you. Is there anything else I can get for you in the meantime? I got the water. Do you need a bathroom break or anything? How are you? So I know I introduced myself when we're out there, but again, my name is Detective Bates, and this is Sergeant Taylor. 
trying to get you in the paper. I need you to sit in the seat for me. It's all about camera angles. Things are not happening. That would be great. Can I get you in the water, Snacks? Doing all right? Can be expected. How long have you lived here in Iowa? Six years. Six years? In the same house? Wow. You married? Single? Where'd you move from? He's in county. And how long were you up there for? I'm a little nervous. <laughs> You're that. You know, to be honest with you, if I was sitting over there, I'd be a little nervous too. So don't don't worry about it. We're just here to talk, to get your side. And right now we're just asking you just two quick questions. I can only lived here, that kind of thing. I watched so. too many detective movies. <laughs> How about you? Which one's your favorite? <laughs> <laughs> Me too. You can't, honestly, I, I sit there and I'm married and I sit there and watch a little with my wife and I say that, like, we don't. That's not how we do it. Hey, that's not right. So don't take, there's some good ones out there, don't get me wrong. But most of them are, are probably a little off base. We're not as mean. I won't get up and beat you up. We don't do that. We just want to get to know you a little. So if you just kind of want to share a little about yourself and what brought you down here. And... So I trust my attorney. He said, don't say anything. And I said, I have nothing to hide. And he's like, I know that, but just let me be there with you when we talk. So, uh, uh, you guys seem nice people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to hide anything. I can't be difficult. This is really, if you knew all the pieces, I think you'd have a lot of empathy for well, what's going on. That's and really what we're looking for. That's what we're looking for. And you're an adult. And the thing about our interview, if we ask you any questions that you don't want to answer, you can just tell us, I don't want to answer that question. But we do want to have a basis and an understanding of what's going on in that home or what went on up north that brought them into your home. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to share any of that and you don't want to answer any other questions, that's okay. I'd, I'd like to just tell you, but I don't, I don't know who you are. I don't know if you're going to flip my words. I, I don't know. And that's the good thing about cameras. Everything, it's pretty much double recorded, audio, video, and it's for the safety of you, for you and for us because we don't want to flip your words. And this will all be pretty much right there to support you. So we're not going to use anything attorney against you. be so insistent then. He's an honest, good man. He goes to church. I trust him. Why would he say that to me then? I don't know. I don't, I don't know your attorney, to be honest. Well, I'm just but saying he's, he's a, he's he's a good, honest man. man. Yeah, I don't and know. I'm an honest person as well, so we get along great. And he just said, do not say anything. Maybe just as an attorney, they just... They always say that. They always want to be with their client. I'm not sure. But like I said, at any time, if you don't want to answer a question, you don't have to. So the ball's really in your court on what you do want to answer and what you don't. So, well, I think it, it looks sad that I don't want to answer anything, but it's not because I'm trying to be difficult. I'm really hanging on what he told me to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, who's your attorney? Adam, 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 uh, his father's an attorney, his brother's an is attorney. He, is he local? Yeah. Is it local? I don't know. He's down um, the street of the... Town Hall is. Well, Joe, they all the same name. The whole yeah. reason we're sitting here today is we just we there's a lot of questions we have that we just maybe misunderstandings that we just mm -hmm. need to clarify. And I know, and I'd love to tell you if he were here because I don't know, I, I don't I don't know what's going to happen with what I say. You know, I I watched. I'm a psychologist. I've watched people flip things all the time. So I get it. I, I, I sit on your side. I get it. I wish people didn't do that, but they do. Well, if you're not willing to answer any of the questions about yourself, would you be willing to answer any questions maybe about Ruby or Kevin that you could help us understand? We just honestly want to understand what what their dynamic is, what happened to the children, what caused their separation. Right. And after talking to Kevin, it sounds like you know a lot about their dynamic mm -hmm. and their relationship. So if you could help us understand that at the least, 
that would be awesome. And that's nothing incriminating towards yourself because it's not pertaining to you. So if you could help us understand that. Jody, we're, we're going to do this. You asked for your attorney and we'll, we'll leave it at that. We'd like to maybe talk to you later when you have your attorney here present. Absolutely. And, and we'll go he made an okay. appointment at 4 she, on he Friday. Made an appointment here. With, at here at 4? He talked to the, to the officer okay. and said, can we even make a time? And he said out loud, do not talk to them. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I'll, I'll talk and see if we can schedule that, and maybe that's just something we we just do with your attorney. Okay? Do you have any questions for us or anything we can answer in the meantime? No. Okay. No. All right. Appreciate your time. We'll uh, we have you hang tight in here, and we'll come back and get you, and we'll be on our way, okay? Thank you. Thank you. But you know, I'm going to read the Miranda rights before we start. We're just going to kind of ask you a few questions about your involvement. Okay? So, first, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be held against you in the court of law. Okay? You have the right to an attorney or to have him or her present while questioning if you cannot afford to hire one. One will be afford, or, um, hired to represent you. If you decide to answer questions, you can stop at any time. Okay? Do you understand your rights? Uh, I do. Okay. Do you wish to speak to me now? Uh, well, I want to pick up my kids. How about this? We're going to ask you some questions, and if you don't want to answer them, you just say, hey, man, I'm not going to answer that. Sure. And but you just say, hey, I'm not going to talk. That's not beneficial to you, and then we're done. We're going to learn, and we're going to learn. Sure. You understand that, right? Yes. Okay. Okay, so just for starters, what was your full name? Kevin William Frankie. How do you spell that? K E V I N W I L L I A M F R A N K E. And what's your date birth? What's a good address for you? Uh, my, well, I, I'm not comfortable giving my address right now. Okay. But you do live in Springville? I do. How long have you lived in Springville for? Um, I moved there in 2007 with my family. So okay. was and how many, 17 years. So, and how many kids do you have, Kevin? I have six kids. And what are their names? Some of them are teenagers, two adults. So are they all living with you or? No, I haven't seen them for over a year. Any of them? No, none of them. For a year? Over a year. Okay, so. I've been in a separation. From who? From my wife and family. What's your wife's name? Ruby. Ruby. When was the last time you saw Ruby? The last time I saw her? Yeah. Was um, the 18th of, of this month. We met to, she requested me to sign over vehicles or the titles to the vehicles, the vehicle that she drives that were all in my name. When's the last time you physically saw Russell or Eve? Um, the day that I moved out, July 24th, 2022. 24th of 2022? Or July 25th, July 25th. So it's my understanding that, that at least...
home here in, in Kayenta and Ivan's. Have you been to that home? No. You've not been to that home? Uh, no, I don't know. I don't know what anything that's been going on. Like this is good, man. Like I would love to be able to help you out with this, and like I'm seeing the light of the end of the tunnel because I'm I'm unaware of your involvement in in what's really going on. So for you to say that you're unaware of the status of your kids kind of makes I know that sounds kind of crummy to you, but it sounds kind of good to me. Like who lives in that home with your is it ex-wife? Is it currently a separated wife? Like, who lives in that home with your children? To be honest, I don't know. I, I know that she's there with um, four of the children, and our two older children has moved out. They're, they're not at your home in Springville? Uh, and I'm not trying to where, trip you up. I can see you're hesitant to talk to me. I understand that. Well, where where I live? No, yeah. I haven't seen them for over a year. Okay. That's tough. I can only imagine how that feels, man. I got kids. And not seen them for that long. That, that would tear a little piece of my heart out. Of age to drive. Does she drive? I don't know. Okay. Like I said, I don't, I don't, nothing is going on so, in their lives or anything going on. How did you find out that you needed to come here to 55 North Main Street? I received a message that I needed to come pick up my kids from the police department in Highlands. And who was that message from? Uh, well, I prefer not to say it right now. It would just help us a lot. I'll try to figure out who reached out to you because it makes sense that that would happen. I'm just not aware of anyone who did that from our department. Right. And, and I'm not comfortable saying right now who reached out to me. Okay. Okay. So you haven't seen any of your kids in over a year, you said? That's correct. And then how old last time you saw her? How old is she now? 15. She's 16. Okay. And then when all the kids left, Ruby took all of them? Um, yeah, she stayed in the house and I moved up. Okay. And did you ever try to reach out to the kids, drop by the home, or no. was there? I honored the no separation boundary that we agreed to. So what there was, was no your separation? Contact boundary, excuse me. Did you have a no contact order in place? Order? No, this was between my wife and my so, what did Ruby ask of you when you separated? What did she ask of me? Did she ask you not to contact the kids? Ruby invited me to leave the home mm -hmm. while I um, thought about the, the choices that I've made in my life and the way that I've treated her. Okay. And so I left. And how long had you and Ruby been married before? We were married in 2000. So about 22 years? Uh, when we separated, we were going on 22 years. Yes. Okay. And during your marriage, how was, how was disciplining your kids? How would you discipline your kids? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to answer that question. Okay, that's fine. No. Have, have you been since separated or since they lived here in the city of Ivins? Um, have you communicated with your wife regarding like discipline with your kids or their care or their physical well-being? No. So is she doing this on her own and just telling you how your kids are? She's not telling me anything about the kids. Who's this? Who's this uh, female Jody that your wife lives with? Do you do you know a female named Jody? She is a, a therapist and a life coach, I know, and she's... Do you respect her? Uh, do I respect her? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think she's a very honest, truthful person, yes. Okay. You place value on Jody? I don't know what that means. Like, do you, do you, do you value what she says and, and how she... Treats is your wife a client of hers? Is your wife a partner of hers? Is your wife 
a roommate with her? If your kids are living in her house is what I'm trying to say. I'm not aware of that, but I know that they've been in business for the last year filming. Who's they? Ruby and Jody. They Ruby film, and Jody, you think? They film podcasts, and so every week a podcast goes up and I listen to it. And <laughs> What's the name of it? Uh, connections with an X. Like C O N. C O N N E X I O N S. Yeah. And now, do you support them in that role in doing that and having? Do I support them in the business? Yeah. Like, do you, do you support them and think that what they're doing is a good thing, or? Yeah, I support their business efforts. I think it's a good thing. Are you involved with their business efforts, or? No. Okay. So just Ruby and Jody. No okay. In the business. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And were you involved in the eight passengers account with your family? Um, yes. I was in the videos, and if that's what you mean. I briefly learned about this two <laughs> hours ago. <laughs> so, did Ruby more so do the videos for the family? Mm -hmm. And how long did you guys do that for? Uh, she started the channel in 2015. And as far as, as I'm aware, from the time I left, the last video she uploaded was towards the end of 2021. Okay. And I, but I, again, I'm not aware of anything she's done since our separation. Okay. I don't visit eight passengers anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> chapter of your life that's gone? It, it, it's a past chapter, yeah. So how do you and Ruby communicate? Just through text, phone call? Through text, and if there's anything considered an emergency, we agreed that we would communicate through a phone call. Okay, and do you know her phone number off the top of your head? Off uh, the top of my head? Uh, <laughs> no. Okay, no worries. So, how often would you guys communicate while she was down here? Well, I don't know how often or long she was down here. We've communicated maybe four times in 2023 since January. So are you aware of how she disciplines the kids or how she handles no. the kids with behavioral issues or anything like that? No. So you're unaware of how she does that? Yes. Okay. Are you aware of the physical condition of your children? No. No. I'm, I've chosen to trust my wife with the children. That was part of the agreement of our separation. Is that you allow her to physically provide for the needs of the child and you're just removed from that? I mean, you pay support. I know this is personal questions, but... No, yes, my job is to financially provide for I'm just trying to figure out like, how, how much of a role do you play in the caretaking of specifically, is it, of, of those two kids? I, I pay the bills. Okay. With my, my job, I provide the money goes into a shared bank account, and that's my only involvement. Okay. Um, like, there's a whole bunch of things that I want to talk to you about, but I, I still can't get over the fact that someone notified you to come here to pick up your kids. My guess is, was that, was that uh, Jody? No, I'm not going to answer that question. Okay. All, all I'll say is, well, you, someone you said you trusted her. her, you said that you think she's... Um, I asked you if you place value on her, but you, you obviously... She is an honest, I know her to be an honest and a trustworthy individual. And so, yeah, I trust her. And um, I received a communication that... And so I left immediately from my job and drove down here. That's all I know. I've come to pick up my kids and to take them home with me.
Do you have any, is there a custodial paperwork that says that you're like a, there's, there's no custodial paperwork denying you of rights, correct? Uh, there's no custodial paperwork at all. Period. So the kids mine. are yours. They are mine. Okay. Mine, yes. We, this was a, just a verbal agreement between my wife and I when we said mm -hmm. last year. Well, what questions do you have? Oh, I want to know what's going on and why I was asked to come down and pick up my two kids. Well, and then a lot of that kind of hinges on who asks you because if we had been the one, like, I'm, I'm not going to say you fit, but I'm, I'm confident a cop didn't call you because we wouldn't have wanted you down here at this point in our investigation. So, having said that, I, I think it's time we, we be honest with you, right? Sure. No, and, and I didn't lie. You're so a, someone contacted me, but I don't want to you say said without someone a from your office, but okay. Saying something from my office. Our office. No. Someone, yeah, so we don't know who called you. So right. if we knew who called you, then we could help you. It would make more sense. But. Well, I don't know the legal ramifications of implicating individuals who contacted me. And so without a lawyer here, I don't want to answer that question. That's okay. But you're, you want to know specifics of the case, which we can't share right now because it's under investigation. So, I see. yeah, so we would like to ask questions about where you found out, but we'll respect that if you don't want to share that information. But I am curious, when you guys had the previous Eight Passengers YouTube channel, you guys got a lot of heat for neglect and child abuse. A lot of people commented those things on there. Why were they commenting those things? That's a good question. Um, we... Uh, we had a son who was acting out in very selfish behavior. Just Chad, or yes, yeah, this Chad? was Chad. And you know, none of this is strange or odd. You could get on YouTube and find out all sorts of stuff on this. It's like a double-edged sword. Yeah, the question is, what do you believe, right? There, yeah. there was even an article written in. Um, Newsweek magazine in 2020 on it, and or news was it Newsweek? No, Business Insider, where we were interviewed and, and we were pretty straightforward and we talked about it and we shared our piece in that. Basically, it boils down to he was being um, very cruel and mean to his siblings that he shared a room with. And so we removed him from the room. And we said, you can sleep anywhere you want. Sleep on the couch, sleep on the pull-out bed, sleep on the floor for all we care, but you're not sleeping in that room with your brother. Um, he chose to sleep on a bean bag. So nine months later, he had made a lot of changes in his life. And he was ready to, and, and we had moved by that time. And so we had a new house, and he was ready to move into his own bedroom. Made a video about it. And in the video, he mentioned something of the effect of, I've been sleeping for nine months on a beanbag. And that is what all the uproar was about. What did you guys do to help, like, with his behavioral issues? Is that. Is that something you and Ruby talked about together? Is mm -hmm. and then did you? Mm -hmm. Helping you discover yourself and fix behavioral issues and things like that. Is that is that something you and Ruby sought out to help correct, like some of the things? Yes, and, okay. and I supported it, and so together we held boundaries for our son to support his choosing honest and responsible choices. And when he chose honest and responsible choices consistently is when he began to get his privileges back. And that was, that was, Jeremy, right? well, that was the uproar, right? Yeah. And, and so... Um, but yes, um, 
through 2000. with him because I'm honoring the no contact separation boundary with, uh, that I agreed to with my wife, but I understand that he's um, 18, living on his own, somewhere in Provo, and working and supporting himself. What other kids went down to visit Jody? What other kids? Yeah, did you send any of the other kids down to oh, spend time with send... Jody? down to spend time with Jody, they would meet on Zoom. Ah, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, we were in the spring stuff. Uh -huh. Well, even in 2019, we would, she would meet with Jody. So when did Ruby and Jody, to your knowledge, like, decide to collaborate, come together and mesh life? Because that's what it's, that's what's happened. Well, the, they decided to start a business in 2021. So while you, while you and Ruby were together. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and but there were you know at that period it was pretty nebulous. I I don't know. What's yeah. that word mean? <laughs> it was it was just a lot of talk and everyone okay. like solid plans. It was let's start by you know doing podcasts together and and then that's all I know. I know that uh, they published a book together recently, you can find it on Amazon, it's not a secret. Um, was business thriving, like life was good between those two? Uh, well, not that I was aware. Well, at some point, and again, I'm not digging into your life, but I'm trying to understand this, at some point, we did, took, did kick you well, out? When you talk about a business, you know, thriving, uh -huh. In terms of business and money, when when we stopped eight passengers on YouTube, we lost ninety percent of our income. Mm -hmm. So to say that business was thriving, uh, in my perspective, no, Got it. I don't think it ever was. After was, that, was that part of your guys' reason for separation after you guys ended eight passengers? Uh, was that part of the reason? Mm -hmm. um, I, the, the reasons are because of, of ways that I treated my wife and, um, and some um, of my own addictions that I was working through and seeking help on with um, with uh, pornography. Thank you for sharing that. And I've, yeah, I've made some wonderful progress. Like, is that something you came to the realization that you needed help and weren't doing things right? Or is that something that, like, Jody helped you guys recognize that maybe Ruby needed more? I'm trying to understand her involvement in your guys' life. Um, She's my focus, so just to be honest. I understand and I, I can perceive that. Um, Jody and Ruby have a, um, a close relationship and, and Jody saw the need for me to get help. And um, frankly, I agree. I, the space um, has been exactly what I need to face you know, my own um, addictions and and receive the support and help that I've needed. And so the space has been um, very, very good for me. Mm -hmm. So when you uh, stated that you and Ruby had this no contact that you guys just verbally agreed upon, was that an idea given by Jody that she recommended you guys have that space? 
and not contact one another? I'm not aware of that. It, the, the invitation for me to leave and take space was from my wife. Okay. But that was while Jody and Ruby were friends and collaborating and doing podcasts and sure. Well, you're the you're the custodial parent of these children. I don't see why we can't explain to you what why we're involved. So I don't recall the exact time, but sometime before eleven o'clock today. We received uh, a phone call from 911 on our dispatch that uh, a 12 to 13 year old boy was knocking on doors in the neighborhood asking for food and water, that he was severely emaciated, that he had what is emaciated? skinny, scrawny, uh, malnutritioned, not enough food, not enough water to sustain life. So he had, I'm sorry, what? he had duct tape on his extremities, on his hands, on his ankles, and those were covering rope burns that were used to tie him down. Take a second and think about what I just said. That's the condition of your son. Given that information, your son was taken to the hospital. A warrant has been applied and granted by the Department of Child and Family Services to remove from your wife's care. So no one right now is going to have access to these two children based on their physical condition. Do you understand that? Do you, would you condone that behavior? Would I condone that behavior? Um, That's my job. My job is to find out your knowledge of the treatment of these, these based precious on children. No. But again, I don't know the details or I don't know what's going on, but as you described that, that sounds horrible. Horrible. Disgusting. No human being should be treated like that. I, yeah, okay. That's my thoughts, but again, we might be different on that. Um. We're going like, to sit here for a second, okay? We're going to go out and talk. Um, I'm not saying you're, you're still not free to go. Are you under arrest? Absolutely not. We just have lots of questions that we need to figure out. Lots. Uh, okay. Okay. Because your, your children are under medical care right now. And what does that mean? And it means that you don't have access to. My understanding is that they are. What is that? They're in the custody of DCFS. And they will be for the next seven. There's a medical hold on them right now. So for at least the next seventy-two hours, based on our understanding. At least the next seven days. During observation, they're, you're being watched. DCFS sure is going to provide you that information and they can better answer your questions along those lines. That's handled through them. Okay. Right. So we'll be back. So I want you to think about some things, though. I don't know. I don't know. Listen to me. Listen to me. I want you to think about that for a minute. Don't have no idea where they're at. We're going to hop out here. We'll be back in a minute, okay? That's still recording audio and video, okay? So if you would, don't make any phone calls. Sure.
Mm-hmm. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thank you.
What's going to happen to my wife? I love my wife. I don't know. I'm being honest with you. I don't know. I haven't had any of you with me. I don't know if charges against my wife. Possibly. I think given the circumstances, that's highly appropriate. But again, I don't know your wife. I was hoping to gain some insight from you, but... I don't necessarily know that that's something you wanted to. I trust her. A road you wanted to travel down with me, so. And not without legal representation. Yeah, no, I, I get it. But I love my wife, and I trust my wife. And so, I mean, this feels like getting run over by a steam truck while you're sharing with me today. Yeah, you, I can tell you're caught off guard. I thought I was just coming here to pick up my kids, and yeah. for what, I don't know what or why, but. And I was fine, I'm taking them back with me. And just. I mean, I'd love to have a candid conversation with you. I just don't know how it's going to be received by you. I don't know you, but I can tell you my perception of how this happened. Uh, well. I'm Whether interested you value in that or not, it's... Look, I'm interested in facts, but mm -hmm. at the same time, I'm. I'm, I'm interested in all the facts. But you understand our facts. Our facts are that you have a child that is emaciated, malnutrition, and has, and has marks. I, I didn't spend any time with her. Sergeant Tobler did. Did any of you spend time with her? Uh, mm -hmm. didn't spend time I, with I have her. not. I mean, she I went to. Today. She was requested to go to the hospital along with Russell, based on their condition. Folks, I don't know what to do. Like, I want to... S you realize that I have a picture of my family on my wall. And I look at it every day. And I work. I work every day. So I can back to my family and save my family. And everything you're sharing to me just sounds like a made up story. Like I I have no idea what you're talking about. Like It's just, it sounds like a horror movie. <sighs> and I get, you're all, you're all doing your jobs, I get it. I understand. And this is, this is my life. I just want my kids. I just want my kids. I just want my family. I don't, know, I don't know what's going on. I, I don't know why these things that you describe happen. I, I don't know. It's almost like, I want to say, I, I'm sorry, y you must have somebody else. Because the,
It's like, am, am I in the right conference room here? No. That's what I feel like. It's reality, you know. I'm having a hard time accepting this and dealing with this. I mean, you're telling me that you're taking my kids from me. Oh, yeah. like, we need to transfer the titles of the car to my name, you know, or um, we're going to cancel these credit cards and, and stuff like that. So just stuff related to the finances really is mm -hmm. the, our, our only communications over the past year. Sure. We've, we've had zero, like zero communications regarding the kids. Okay. I've had no reason to believe or think that there was anything going on. For all intents and purposes, I woke up this morning looking at the picture of my family and making my commitment today, as I do every day, that I'm going to live an honest, a virtuous, and a responsible life today. And what you're sharing with me just feels like a sucker punch. Imagine. Brianna, do you have yeah, questions? So. Okay. <laughs> if I still have a family, yeah. and um, I, I just. jobs. And I know you all have the best interests of my kids at night. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks. That means a lot. I just want my kids back. I want my family back. I want my wife back. I don't want this to sound rude, Kevin. We've got some things to do, but we're not kicking you out. But the building's closed. Okay. You're going to be okay driving home? I really am worried about you. Okay. Do, do your best. Breathe. You've got to pull over the side of the road. And Do you drink Red Bulls? Do you want your water to go, Kevin? Hey guys. Thank you for meeting with us. 
Were you there the first? I thing? was there. I don't think I interviewed with you. Okay. Lieutenant Studley was Lieutenant Studley with time. me the first time. I don't so. remember a lot. So. Yeah. Oh, you're okay. I don't blame you. It's a lot all at once. And Usually long time they'll see is a good thing when you're dealing with a detective. Yeah. 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 But I know that both of my kids have mentioned both of you by names and particularly Good kid. Do you guys by chance have a card? I, I do in the car, okay. but not, not okay. on. So I'll grab that for you, though. Okay. So like I talked to Mr. Kester about, I just want this to be totally ran by you. Uh, I won't ask you any questions that are incriminating. We're not looking at you as a suspect or anything like that. We just are more curious of the dynamic and Jody coming into your relationship, your lives. So if you kind of just want to walk us through that on how she came into your lives and then where things started to change. Jody, you mean? Jody. Er, Jody. Jody. I thought you said Julie, but... Oh, you Jody. 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 Yeah, yeah yes. Jody. Yeah. Yeah, I can do that. I'll, I'll ask first, have you found the pen papers? The pen papers. So we found quite a bit they're, of different uh, journals. We believe they're on the, the computer and the rest of them were sealed like they're trying to mail them off, but we do not have a direct copy of it, no. Because my understanding was we had purchased as a Christmas present for Jody in 2021 a leather, like a leather folder that, you know, three inches thick or whatever, and it had an engraved on the leather on the outside the pen papers, and Ruby wrote detailed notes of everything. All interactions with Jody and Pam Botcher from August 2021 until I don't know when. Uh, and you're saying it's like, is it like a satchel looking leather bit or is it more like a binder? No, well, no, it's like I, I don't even know what it, it call it. it but it's it's flat. You it's well, yeah. You, so you like see, shorter because we do have Ruby's journal, which is from those dates that you mentioned. These, these things are going to be so. She wouldn't write the stuff she wrote in the pen papers. She would not write in her journal. The stuff she wrote in the pen papers was not intended to be read by anybody until God would decree them to be written as scripture for the whole world to read. I believe that's what we, we have. Because okay. uh, you're saying the pen would be different, correct? It's like a well, it was just a in a thing called the pen papers. So okay. it was, and and that's how Ruby referred to those papers. Yeah. So it described all of the visions and tr trances and everything that Jody and how Ruby thick, went into. How thick would you say it was? It was like three inches thick or so. And there were hundreds of pages of written documents that Ruby had. <coughs> and that was given to Jody in 2022 when she left and returned to her home in January. So this is similar. Yeah, like it would look like that. Okay. That's not the journal that we have, so. No, I think you're talking. It looks like a satchel. Or it's like something Jody would yeah. not want found. Yeah. But she wouldn't want to destroy it. Because we we found didn't find that one. in the home. We found an empty one. We did find an empty one. I don't so. remember saying anything oh. on it, though. There's an empty, an empty thing like that. Yeah. There was a full thing, but it was If, if the back. empty one says the pen papers on the outside of it, mm -hmm. then they emptied it. I don't, did I don't remember We'll that. go back through our photos and see if that's... Because yeah. everything in the if, home was photographed. So. If you're interested in Pam Botcher, mm -hmm. that's going to tie Pam Botcher to all of this. What's in those documents? Okay. Okay, so... Um, Can I just interrupt for a minute? I'm sorry. Sure. Is it okay to bring the puppies? Yes, we want the puppies, right? Okay. Okay, so why don't you finish here and then call me when you're done and we'll... Okay. Hey, will you let the bailiff have a word in here so she can bring us a copy of the order? Okay, let me see if I can find it. Okay, thank Thanks. you. Um, in twenty in twenty eighteen, we were psych and uh, 
that's going to be hard to find in today's world. Um, good luck. R Ruby had uh, a very close friend named Paige Hannah, who lives in Mapleton, who was um, a massive <laughs> fan of Connections and Joey Hildebrandt. And in fact, the Hannahs are on the cover of their book. If you know, you've probably seen them. And so um, Ruby started to speak with Jody towards the end of 2018, early 2019, with the um, intention of having her be the therapist to Jody. Um, Jody always had a larger interest in um, communicating with the parents more than with the actual patient which I always found curious. Um, but her theory was, if, if you want to help your child, you have to help yourself first, and then you'll know how to help the child. So she spoke with Ruby frequently, and the frequency of their communications um, ramped up. And then the first conversation that Jody had with Chad was in June of... 2019, while we were on a, a trip to the East Coast. All of her visits with Chad virtual through Zoom. Um, but she would talk with Ruby on the phone or through Zoom quite frequently. Uh, so Jody met with Things got really, it, it got strange around the, um, the fall of 2020. The Hannahs were trying to convince and bring Ruby into. Um, Hi. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Into this um, organization called Connections. And that particularly were focused on things like lust versus love and, and healthy marriages, happier marriages, happier relationships. Um, she invited me to go to a, um, it was like a conference or something held at Thanksgiving Point um, in Lehigh. There were like 100 people there, and that was in the fall of 2019, um, maybe late summer of 2019, late summer, late summer 2019. And my impression at that time was this is, this is absolute craziness. This is a bunch of man-hating women that are just looking for excuses to you know, tear down their husbands, and I mean, that's what it felt like to me when I was in there. Um, it, but it did it was confusing because there were people that I respected a lot that were up on the stage with microphones in hand you know giving testimonials of how great this was and how it changed their lives and their marriage and like the Hannahs were among them you know and and, and so yeah it was confusing um Ruby, then we went on a trip with the Hannahs to the UK in October of 2019. And I swear the whole objective of the trip was to like convince me to get into connections because all of them were in it except me. And, and, but you know, they made some really eloquent arguments and, and I agreed to join a men's group with Jody in January of 2020, and, and I would do it for three months. Um, so I started that men's group in 2020, and you know the group. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been to like a, an addiction recovery group, but that's what, what it was. That's what it felt like. I mean, there were probably ten men in there. It was on Zoom. <laughs> All of them were like working through, you know, various stages of, like, sex addiction, porn addiction, um, drug addiction, and, and 
was just a, it was like a 12-step group, but intended just for general like addiction recovery. And, and I really was like, what the hell am I doing here? Like, I don't belong here. <laughs> But everyone's like, no, come here. Like, you can learn to have a better, like, life and a better marriage. And so I, I thought, okay, whatever. Um, I went through my my three, you know, obligatory three months, and I was ready to leave. And then um, I got challenged to... Oh, thank you. And then I got... I got challenged to sit down and have a vulnerable conversation with my wife and ask her how my lustful choices have affected her. And, you know, to me that was like a loaded question. I thought, uh, you know, I still didn't see what I had done or anything that would constitute any form of, like, you know, abuse or, or anything like that. And. Um, but I did. I, I took the challenge and I sat down and for two hours, Ruby, very emotionally, just shared how she felt in our marriage and how the things that I, um, over 20 years of marriage, you know, asking for sex as a husband frequently or um, asking her to wear lingerie or, or things like that, how that made her feel. And it was really emotional and it touched me. Like, I didn't realize that she felt so strongly about that, that she felt so hurt by that. And so I committed that I would really give it a go. And I stayed in the men's group. And so, you know, in that men's group, I met with Jody every week um, with the other men that were in the group. And, and um, then it got weird because like our our marriage felt like it was getting better and stronger so this was now you know summer and fall of 2020 and, and in addition to that there was the whole youtube cancel thing I, I don't know how much you guys are even interested or aware of that but in may of 2020 some um videos that ruby released on that dealt with Chad just blew up in her face and it was all over the news and hundreds of thousands of TikTokers and all this stuff were just piling on and basically burned down like our YouTube channel and overnight like the income went you know we lost 90% of the income overnight and um, that was hard <coughs> um, was this like the what, which episode was this? Was this the one where they talked about like, the bean bag? Or? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and then they started going back and trying to dig and find, and then they find these little nuggets yeah. like, oh, look, they, Eve went to school without a lunch one day, or, you know, stuff like that. And, um, but it was the bean bag video that really set people off. So, and then they went back from there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So at that time, Ruby was really distraught. She was looking for support. She was looking for someone who would understand her, who, who would validate her, and she found that in Jody. Jody, all, all the stuff she did with Chad was because of Jody, and so she, it makes sense that she would go to Jody, you know, for emotional support when she felt like her world was burning down. Um, in the meantime, like our, I felt like our marriage was was getting stronger. It, it felt better. Like we we didn't fight as much, and um, even though we were having less sex, it it felt more connecting. And and it was just I thought, wow, this is great. Like you know, this this is great. And I was happy to be the guy up on the stage. You know, that started sometime in like late 2020. Or the fall of 2020, there would be a conference, and Ruby would say, I thought we were just attending it, but then she'd say, hey, they, they wanted us to get up and tell our story, you know, and I'm like, oh, okay, sure. And so I'd get up and, and, and just say, like, yeah, I was the guy who said, I think this is a bunch of, like, you know, man-hating, you know, women, but 
it really has made a difference in my marriage, and, and I, it really did. Like, I believed it. Um, and so those conferences and stuff, everything continued like that until March of 2021, when after a conference, that, um, a Connections conference down in St. George, all the, the, like the inner circle all the, the people who were, were being trained um, as you know, mental fitness uh, coaches and stuff. So that was Ruby and a bunch of other people and their spouses. We went out to like a dinner afterwards. And, and that's where Jody really opened up to the women in a private conversation that she believed she was being tormented and haunted by shadow figures every night and um, <coughs> that was spooky you know um, and I don't know exactly what happened but the Hannah's do um, all I know is at some point within a couple days of that in, in that month of March they, the Hannahs drove down from Mapleton and picked Jody up and brought her back to their home in Mapleton and she lived for six weeks in that home in Mapleton and this is where like I don't know what happened but I do know that there's two different sides of stories they tried to introduce her to a new cult lady that the Hannahs were getting into so they wanted to merge their cults into one, apparently. And um, they refer to it as a cult for the time? Oh, no. Or no no one in a cult says, I'm in a cult. cult. <laughs> right. I was wondering. But from your perspective, it looks like two cult leaders merging together. From where I stand now? Absolutely. Um, according to Jody, she was held against her will for six weeks and was kidnapped, and she escaped and got out. According to the Hannahs, after six weeks of Jody stabbing herself with forks and knives, cutting herself and um, wanting to commit suicide and trying to seduce the husband of the family, they kicked her out. I don't know what's the truth. Record. Maybe a little bit of both. I don't know. But the point is, uh, somewhere around mid-April, Jody was back in her home in Ivan's and she was a hot mess. And she reached out to Ruby for help. And Ruby, Ruby was always jealous of the Hannahs that they had a better relationship with Jody than she did. Ruby, and this is like goes back to her childhood. She wanted to be the best friend. She wanted to be the most liked. She wanted to be the the one that everybody knew. And so it hurt her that she felt like she was being excluded from what was going on at the Hannah's house. And then she'd say, why are so many secrets? And the Hannah's would say, it's not secret, it's sacred. And when the time's right, you can know too, you know. Um, so we went down to Jody's house in May of 2021. That was the first time I'd ever been there. And it blew my mind, as you, I'm sure you have walked in there and gone, how does a therapist look like this? Like, it doesn't really make sense to me. But we were there, and she opened up and talked about, you know, her struggles and, and what was going on. And I got to say, like, I'm a smart guy. I'm an engineer. I've designed and helped build some really big stuff. I've been a college professor. I can't explain some of the stuff that happened while we were there. Like crashes in, in the basement while we were talking upstairs. And, and plates like in the kitchen just flying off by themselves like 
full speed smashing on the wall and, and falling to the floor like, by themselves. I, I, I can't explain it, but I saw it with my own eyes and, and I don't have any way to explain it other than there's some crazy shit going on. Ruby was convinced that we could intervene and help Jody. I didn't want a thing to do with it. I tried to like get the bishop involved and say, hey, go to the, like, the priesthood and the church and all that stuff. Just go to your support network. But um, Ruby continued to be like, no, we can help. Like she doesn't want that. Could you imagine like what would happen to her reputation if this got out and stuff? Let's help her. So we. We went down like a couple more times between May and August, but it reached the point where in August, her bishop at the time, a guy named, who's down there in Cayenta named um, Scott Galbraith, he's not our bishop anymore, but I mean, he was going over there like every night and he'd be there for like four hours and just and he'd be like, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fighting evil spirits. I'm casting demons out. I'm, I'm there's crazy stuff going on. And, and finally, he got to the point where he's like, I can't do this anymore. Like, there, there needs to be some sort of resolution. It was at that point that they said, Why don't you take her up to your house? And I was like, Oh hell no! I, I don't want this in my house, but. I was beaten over the head with it, like, that's really insensitive, you know, she's done so much to help our family, and, and you're, you're being selfish, and, and she has needs, and, and come on, like, it won't be for long, and so I, I relented, and I was like, okay, actually, you know, this could kind of be fun, let's just make it fun, and, and we'll, like, she needs a vacation, so we'll just go take drives up the canyon, and, and stuff like that. And it turned into just a crazy house. The moment she showed up in my house, just the weirdest crap started happening. Lights turning on and off, set sounds of people walking in walls, and like sounds like footprints going up walls and across the, the ceiling, and, and like stuff floating around, and, and like, it was just, it was weird, and I hated it. And I became the resident exorcist. That was the title I came up with myself. I thought it was kind of funny, but it was my job to like go and give her <coughs> lessons whenever she started to like go into a trance and, and go into possession, and which started to be a lot. And Ruby would go up and check on her. It started like. Four, every four hours at night, and then it moved every two hours at night, then it moved every hour at night, and then at some point Ruby said, you know what, I'm just going to start sleeping in there. And, and if I need you, I'll come down and get you. And I'm like, that's kind of weird, but okay. And, and that was that. She's, they started sleeping in the same bed. Then she started having like trances and stuff. I would say probably September, where she believed that she was going to heaven and, and seeing God and Jesus and, and talking with them. And she would get together with Pam Botcher. Ruby, Pam, and Jody would get together and do these interventions. That's what they call them. And so they'd just go up and lock themselves in a room for four or five hours, and then they'd come out, and, and they'd all just be on cloud nine, and then and, and Ruby would share with me, like, she had this amazing vision, and, and I wrote it and recorded it all down, and, and we have a work to do from God, and, and, and you're part of it, and... And the bishop's part of it, and we're all part of bringing all this stuff to the world. And so it was, um, and it continued like that until I 
wanted to move on with life. And I would call it dragging my heels. So that was around October. And Jody flipped out because during one intervention, Chad was in the backyard with a bunch of friends. And it was my job to keep all the kids contained in a basement watching movies or playing video games. And I took the dog on a walk and I thought they were done, but they weren't done. And Chad had all his high school friends over in the backyard. Jody flipped out. She was ready to come back to Ivan's on her own that night and Ruby and Pam talked her into staying but that was the first night where Ruby said I want a separation from you and it was an in-home separation and so it was um, it was hard basically there were all these rules now placed on me like I could leave when I wanted, but I couldn't come back until Ruby gave me permission. I couldn't come into the kitchen to eat until Ruby gave me permission. And the upstairs where Jody roamed was completely off limits. I couldn't go upstairs anymore in my own house. Um, and there would be, Ruby would dictate all of the terms of how our interactions would be, when we would talk, when, and, 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 um, and that was hard. And it was during that time that I really became, I would say, dependent upon Ruby. Like, if she said a kind word to me, like, my whole day was made, right? And um, so that separation continued all the way up until the holidays, maybe. Maybe the last week of December, first week of January. And, and then Ruby ended that, that separation. Jody went home this like the second week of January. But by that time, like Ruby, Pam, and Jody were completely determined to do this work that they felt God had for them. And um, I thought it was crazy. Like I thought it was just bad shit crazy. Like Ruby, you have a reputation. You have a multi-million dollar business. You have a brand. And you are just giving it away. She wanted to legally, like, work with Jody's attorney to basically give Jody eight passengers. And, um, and become an employee of Connections. So, basically, the contract was Ruby gives Jody everything and Ruby gets nothing in return. Our manager, um, our YouTube manager at the time was like, um, red flags, red flags, like I don't know how to tell you she is scamming you. Ruby fired him. And I was like, I believe our manager, I think he's right, and Ruby started threatening me with another separation. Just like, this isn't about money. This is about doing God's work. And so we continued in that dynamic for the next six or seven months until she went on a trip with Jody and Pam down to Arizona. And I think they, like, when I read her journal, it, she went into Mexico or something and bought drugs or something, like prescription drugs for the emergency kits and when she came back from that trip before she even brought the bags into the house she pulled me in and said um, I want to talk with you and that's when she asked me to leave and that was July 20th 2022 my interactions with Jody at that point became one of Jody, I was still in the men's group, but the dynamic changed. Instead of being like one of the top people that helped run groups and, and helped support, all of a sudden I was, I felt like I got knocked to the bottom. And Jody was just piling on me every week in the men's groups. And the other men, the, the other men just do whatever Jody does. 
if Jody piles on somebody, they all pile on. If Jody praises somebody, they all praise. And so it, it, it really felt like a, it felt like a, like a pack of dogs. And Jody was the alpha. And whoever she, you know, sicked the dogs on, they would go. Whoever she praised, the dogs would just lick them up and down. And, and that's how these groups went. And so once I was in separation, every week was just hell psychological hell and Jody was running it everything was on zoom and I knew that the only way I would ever get back into my house was I had to get Jody's approval if I didn't get Jody's approval I would never get Ruby's approval but it felt like an impossible task because no matter what I did, no matter how like much I tried to track better, be you know truthful and, and not be selfish, I, every week it was like you're being manipulative, you're being selfish, you're lying, you're you're hiding something, you're still hiding stuff, and and I really started to like question my sanity, honestly. And this after is Jody while. that we were talking about. Mm-hmm. And it, so that continued for an entire year, but it became more and more and more and more and more isolating until, um, you know, Jody, Jody had an approved list of men that I could make phone calls to, and it was basically three men. But two of those, well, no, all three of those three men were like, we don't want to do phone calls with you anymore because you're being manipulative. And I'm like, well, who told you that? Well, Jody did. So I was completely cut off. And I, you know, if I went to my church leaders, I was seeking enablement. If I went to my family, I was seeking enablement. If I went to anybody, I was seeking enablement. And so it just, it felt like a no win. I felt trapped. And that's where I was all the way up until the last week of July when Jody called me one day out of the blue and just said, I don't understand why you're not getting it. You're not changing. I don't get it. So I've been asking God what to do. And God told me that you need just to have complete complete um, what's the word they would use um, solitude with God become a monk yeah. <laughs> and I was like what, what do you mean and she's like um, I don't want you to come to men's group anymore and I don't want you to do phone calls with any of the men and I'm like well then who am I going to talk with who, who's going to support me God will. You need to learn to go to God. And so I'm just like, there's nobody. You're just, I mean, I'm I'm going to be completely cut off. And she's like, no, you'll have God. So that was the last week of July. And that was my last interaction and contact with Jody. But it was strange because at that time, around that time, things with Ruby started like picking up and I didn't understand why, but like Ruby wanted to meet in a parking lot and wanted me to sign over titles of documents. Like the the two of our cars wanted me to sign them over to her name. And to Ruby. But I was like, okay, you know, I'm just not, uh, I'm, I'm in total compliance mode at this point. Just like, I'm a good husband, you see, you can trust me. And, and so whatever she asked, like, sign over the, the, the cars to me. No questions, just okay. And then another thing, she was like, I might want to do an investment, but I will need your signature. Do you trust me enough that I could get your signature if I wanted to pursue my own investment. Uh, yeah, sure. Whatever you say. Um, 
How big of an investment? What's she talking about? What did she tell you? She never did, and I never signed anything. She never brought anything to me. But when I returned to the house, everything was packed up, and a neighbor came over and said she asked for the HOA rules and and mentioned to him that she wanted to rent the house out. Which I was like, are you kidding me? And he, apparently she wanted to sell the house, but couldn't because my name was on the mortgage. And I think, I think that's what she was talking about of, will you sign something if I just put it in front of you? And you know what? I probably would have. Like that's how messed up I was. I'm glad you didn't. Me too. <laughs> that would have been disastrous. But I can't describe to you what torture and hell it was to live an entire, it was more than a month really, in complete isolation. Believing that I was like evil and, I mean, manipulative and lying and selfish and I, that I had abandoned my family and that I was more interested in my selfishness than my family. And I think moving forward, you going through that is going to be extremely helpful. I felt that way because a lot of those are the same words that were used with them and you're going to understand how they felt, you know. We've already talked about yeah. that, actually. In the, t the, f the couple of times we've met, I've said, this is how I felt. Did you feel that way? Like, yes, this is how I felt. Like, when we each confess to things that we didn't do, I'm like, I confess to things I never did. But I was so scared. And he's like, that's what I did, too. So we connected on that level, you know. And, and it's crazy that anybody can get to that level of desperation. But we were there. We were there. And this is the end of July, what you're saying? End of July 2022, or the last time you saw Jody was... 23. 23, okay. The last communication I had with Jody was um, the last week of July. It might have been like the first couple of days of August, but just that. Just shortly time. before we made contact with you. Yeah. Or you month. made contact with us. A month before. Yeah. Okay. So for that whole month, my life was literally wake up, exercise, go to work, pretend everything's okay, come home, do connections like workbooks and read scriptures and try to strip selfishness out of my life. Like, go to bed, wake up, repeat every day, boom, 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 boom. I mean, I was so upside down. And my plan was in six months, I get to reach back out to Jody again and, and, and she'll let me back in the group and then I can prove, oh, I don't know if I heard a door or a knock, but it's going on if I get to. Might be your kids. Might be. <clears throat> oh. And we can. Has it been an hour? Almost. I told you it wouldn't take an hour. <laughs> I'm and sorry. We're good too if you need to head out. That was seriously. I guess we only, just wanted, yeah. The only questions I would have, and just going back, you said that she was having like these visions of like what's, what did we ever privy enough to understand or be told what those visions were? A couple of them. What, what were the two that they should we tell you about? So, like one of them, she would, was walking along the beach with Jesus. Jesus challenged her to go st walk on the water, and it was a whole lesson on walking on the water. Another, she would walk with Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother, and she learned about, she had a pet lion in heaven named Charles. I, I, I don't know why I never forgot that name, mm -hmm. but, but it was like this massive lion, and she got to ride the lion and, and learned that, you know, all about who she was and this pet lion and all there was another one where there was a lot of satanic ones 
where um, when she would go into possession mode, she would talk in like different voices. It was really creepy. Mm -hmm. But the voices would say, she's ours, we're not letting go. She is Satan's bride. Um, she's mine. I'm going to marry her. You know, so if she was faking it, she believed that she was trying to, or, or Satan wanted her as her bride. And then you said, I'm just clarifying, so the last time you saw the kids was when you separated that in July, is that what I'm thinking? Of 2022. Do you have any questions for us? No, I'm just really interested in the pen papers. Like, for my own curiosity, I want to know what was going on in all of those little interventions and I'll look back through the photos because, like I said, we documented everything in the home, whether we took it or if we didn't. And then I'll reach out to you, Mr. Kester, okay. and let you know. So but, I have a couple of observations when you're done. Yeah, go for it. So I, I always thought it was interesting, now that you mentioned that she was riding a lion, Kevin t told me that when they were having these group meetings, she would never show up. She would show up on the WebEx, but in place of her person, would just be this X for the connection. So it's like this Wizard of Oz thing going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She never showed her face. She, showed her face. she yeah. always covered herself. Yeah. Like even in the hottest of summer, she would wear these hoodies. She would smell so bad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She would never bathe. And but she was trying to hide her arms and stuff because apparently Ruby told me they were just like mutilated. So the other thing that I think it's important for them to know is during that whole time when you were out, <coughs> you had communication with Ruby maybe three or four times. But yeah. each time, or at least on some of the occasions you spoke to her, she's telling you that everything's blissful, we're doing well, you know, everything's so much better without you. And oh, well, that would be communicated to me by Jody every week. Okay. And the men's groups, too. And it was just like, your abandoning your family your and, and it always hurts so bad because it's like I want to be with my family so bad what do you mean I'm abandoning them if you wanted to be with your family you would change you would stop being selfish you would but you keep being selfish so you want it and it was just felt like well how do I stop wanting it then it's like then you must change well how do I change well you got to want it well <laughs> what you know so how do I want it you got to change it's this like perpetual cycle yeah, yeah. there's no what is it? I tried to find my way into that cycle and, and it felt like have you ever had a dream where there's like a problem you're trying to solve but you can't solve it and how frustrating you feel that's what my life felt like and as I'm looking back and I'm realizing there was no solution it was, there was, you either had Jody's approval or you didn't. There, I wasn't doing anything different than the other men in the group. But they got her approval, so they were praised and they were repenting and they were doing everything right. I, on the other hand, was manipulative and selfish and enabling and all blah, 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 blah. And she became like the arbiter of, of truth, the arbiter of forgiveness, God's own mouthpiece, and it, it was just messed up. Well, I'm glad that you're seeing <laughs> clearly, that. you know, coming, and kind of came out of it. Yeah, yeah so. Yeah. Yeah. One last mm -hmm. discussion. So, in the home, when the warrant was issued, there was a bag with $85,000 cash in yes. it. And I understand her lawyer, Ruby's lawyer, has all that. I'm not... Which home are we talking about? Ivan. In Ivan's? In the Ivan's home. We we don't know. We The money was left where it was left. We didn't take yeah. it. We didn't keep it with us. The house was secured when we left. We're assuming that uh, Lamar Winward yeah, he has to retrieve it. But we don't... 
I couldn't tell you. Yeah. What were the other pieces? So, here's kind of the issue. That money, she cleaned out their bank accounts. The kids' savings accounts. Yeah, and yeah. yours too, your joint account. Yeah. And that's where that money came from. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you can have or if I need to have a discussion with the county attorney. Kevin would kind of like his kids' money back. Yeah, <laughs> so it would be civilly, so I would go address yeah, that. Talk to Lamar. Lamar, see, yeah. See what those funds are being used for. I don't think he wants to give them up. And I wouldn't either if yeah. I were yeah. here. Yeah. I think he's using it for attorney fees. Yeah. I don't know if the county attorney is going to be able to separate that out unless the judge has already separated it out. Even the county attorney's going to look at it and go, it's, a, it's civil, it's you pull through guys' money in some sense. And, and but if you to, did, The judge would have to divide that up to where it goes. We couldn't do that. At least the county attorney would If you did go civil, though, I feel like that would be your fastest yeah. route to... It's just dirty what she did. Yeah. So, she stole yeah. money. She stole money from my 18 year old son out there. Yeah. And that's wrong. Well, the other thing that you did, that I don't know, I mean, there's a lot there, but I think they need to know that while Jody was living in your home, she was also purportedly giving therapy to Chad, and Chad was paying Every week. her. He's like what, at that time 15, we were 16? paying her. Oh, okay. It wasn't until Chad moved out that part of his therapy was he needed to he needed to pay for his own therapy. So at, at age seventeen, he was paying her nine hundred dollars a month to he, get brainwashed. Dad at seventeen, he did. What, what, what was he doing for work? He worked at um, at a a lifeguard basically okay lifeguard supervisor at two different rec check. centers yeah. so it was like the majority of his check was going to Joey he was paying her more than he's paying rent wasn't he three times as much um, that's crazy yeah. uh, I mean, obviously you see her house and what she has she's making there's a lot of money going around maybe there's a lot of money I don't know if we can Right, but we'll say, I'm not sure if we know where that money came from or where it went. Like, it doesn't seem like she's had me come with the past little bit. So, did her book sales were her book sales? I can't imagine, I can't imagine they were. But, um, anyway, I need to get my kids. Yeah, well, so definitely let you go. Thank, you. thank you so much for your time. And I, I appreciate I it. I want to uh, <coughs> cooperate though, and anything related to Jody and moving to Pam. Mm -hmm. And if I can help. Uh, well, we appreciate we'll, that. We'll reach out to your attorney if that's okay. If you have any other questions, you can, you can do it on the phone or something. You don't have to be in person. You can do some clerk. This is a free call from Ruby Denke, Purgatory Corrections. An inmate at Purgatory Correctional Facility. This call is subject to recording and monitoring. Press 1 to accept all communications from this inmate and Telmate. To deny this call, press Thank you for using Telmate. Yeah? Yeah, hi. Okay. When I saw how long this separation was lasting, I wanted to think of some ways that I could bring in money or make some money if he didn't ever come back. So I was, that's when I asked if you would co-sign on a loan if I found a house and maybe I could Airbnb it or rent it out or I didn't playing with numbers in my head and I think I could make something but I don't want to be dumb and I want to be very conservative so I I pulled the money and I have it in a bag and with you do the police have it well I I don't know what the police took I don't know what the police have but the bag is at Jody's they house just, they can't just take people's money. I mean, that, that's not right. 
Well, they're not going to take the money, but when they have a search warrant, they have access to everything in the house. Sure. I, I have a feeling we're going to need that money. We might do. We might do. So um, I haven't been making big purchases. I've been very conservative. I think the biggest expense has been the kids schooling, and that's um, they have enough curriculum to get them for a couple of years. So. Uh. Um, okay. I just received a text from Ted Dawson out of the blue. Hmm? His door, Ted Dawson, who I haven't heard from in years. What, he just texted you? Yeah, the but story he's out. So he said, Stormy sent me an article, and it just broke my heart. I just wanted you to know I'm thinking about you, and if I can ever be a resource, we are always here. Are we in the news? It sounds like at at least you're in the news. I don't know about me. I don't know what he's talking about. I'm wondering if they went to Sherry to, like, ask her questions. I don't know. These bookings are public. I know they are. And a couple months ago, Business Insider was reaching out to me, and I ignored their email. But um, I'm going dark. This is a witch. I'm not at BYU. I'm not at BYU anymore, so I don't know how they're going to find me. Yeah, maybe it was a blessing. This is a witch hunt. I, I. the devil's been after me for years, and he's mad as hard to go. Have you but shared that with the detectives? I have not said a word until we have an attorney. Okay, well, you know that this phone call is being recorded. You have one minute remaining for this call. Yes, that will come out. That will come out. Okay. When we were when we were driven to the jail, um, the detective was putting us in the car, and Jody said. They're going to be in the hospital for three days. So weird. It's just not necessary. They're trying to exaggerate this. Oh. I, well, I don't. They didn't show me. Like the hero. Well, they didn't show me any pictures or anything, but the way they described it, it was very serious. You have exceeded the allowable time for this call. Goodbye. And please see the truth. I know it's obscured. I'm, I'm, where I see the facts, I see the truth. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm gathering. You know my heart. What are they charging you with? Two degrees a second, two charges of second degree felony for child abuse. Two charges of second degree felony child abuse. Yes. Um, okay. Wow. That's very serious. I have It's interesting, I had the prompting over the last month to read Victor Frankel. <laughs> like, I was reading him, and it was like, you, the worst part was not knowing the end. He said those who, he said he had a, a an inmate that's man search for meaning, and he was a prisoner in World War II, and he said, 
the worst part and the greatest bringing of depression was not the lack of food and it wasn't the weather conditions. It was not knowing how long it would last. So I think I was prepared for this. I do feel strong mm-hmm. and I feel calm. And you know what? They they may... Adults have a really hard time understanding that children can be full of evil and what that takes to fight it. You've seen what it takes to fight evil. It's not the person you're fighting. And it can look like something it's not. And you've been there. You know that. And so I don't know any adults who are going to see the truth. So I'm calm about this, and I just pray that you'll hang in there. You have yeah. one minute remaining for this call. I think I can call back. But yeah, but just in case, I'm, I'm preparing to step up and fight for the children that have been taken. And they're going to be, there's going to be a hearing in the next couple of days here in Provo. I'm sorry, I just, I signaled to, to Joe. Will you say that one more time? Yes. I'm prepared to step up and fight for the children. They've been taken into custody. They're in foster care, and there's going to be a hearing within the next uh, two or three days. What about Abby and Julie? Them too. All four were taken. Where did they go to get Abby and Julie? I don't know. They, they. While I was with them, they got Abby, and they were looking. You have for exceeded Julie. the allowable time for this call. Goodbye. I don't know what you called. You had to put her in a, in a chair, and it was it was horrible. It was torturous last night hearing the screaming and, and the banging and people. It's like okay, that's that's you know upsetting. But the most upsetting thing is that I am completely misunderstood. That is the most horrible feeling. Like my own family misunderstands me. They misinterpret me. And and poor Jody, they they misinterpret her. They misunderstand her. She puts her neck out on the line for people and then they get mad at her. I mean, it is just horrendous. It's horrendous. And you know what? Every Joseph Smith, every, every wonderful man of God has had to be misunderstood. That's right. And And so I'm going to get out of this. Who knows? Maybe maybe in 10 days I'll get out of this. If I'm, you know, if the truth prevails right now or, you know, who knows, like 20 years? I I don't know. I don't know how long. But I'm going to step out. I'm going to say I went through everything I have seen. God's children suffer. All the people here, my jail cellmates, have been beautiful women, but they've been hurt. You know, they've been deceived into drugs. And my heart it just has so much compassion for them. And I, I have compassion for the cops, and I have compassion for myself. And I... And then to be told that I'm suicidal, I'm like, no, no, that's not true. Anyway, um, if you need to let me... That was either Sherry or one of your siblings. Well, they're all in cahoots. One means all of them, but yes, you're right. In your hearing, I don't know if you've considered this. I don't know if it would be helpful, but you could have the house. And if... all the kids go to the house. You've got room there, and I, I will, I will gladly stay away and and let you guys be. So I don't know if that's well, helpful. I'm just giving it to you if it is. Thank you. And in the discussions with with my attorney, that that's the only way that we're going to retain custody of the children. That's fine. There is. He is 35 years in this, and he said, even if you are acquitted and um, are released, they will place legal restrictions on your access to the under-18 children. I figured such. I figured such. 
God told me. God told me when I was driving before I called you. I didn't have any information. I didn't know anything. And the Spirit said, your children are going to be removed. And I just, I cried out loud. I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm not done. I'm not ready. And God told me I'm done. And I, I just, oh. So. Mm. Satan has taken everything oh, away from me that I love. And I'm a good woman. I don't do naughty things. I don't do naughty things. I'm a really good girl. Uh. Ruby, I'm going to do everything that I can. Okay. To keep (sighs) truth in our family and I'm I'm committed to our family. I'm committed to you and our marriage, no matter what happens. Thank you. Thank you. I will be here to support you in any way that I can. Well, thank you for stepping up. This I this... do need to go, but okay. All right. call me back. When or if you need. When will you find out? How can I call you? When should I call so I find out what they say? I don't know how long this will go, but if you call this afternoon, I I will know. This is a preliminary hearing, so there will be no... Okay. Well, it's hard to get a phone around here. I asked for a phone, and it took hours to get it, so it may not be until later tonight. Okay. That's fine. Okay. All right. Good luck. I will be praying for you. you. Okay. Bye. Goodbye. I was almost done. You know, I yeah. I had um, a guy from a ward that I was staying. I was at their ward. He came over and he gave me a blessing. And he told me uh-huh. probably about two months ago. He said, "You're," and he doesn't he doesn't know anything about me. He doesn't know about what I do for a living yeah. or anything. And he goes, "Your what you've been doing is going to change. You're going to be teaching differently in the next little while." Wow. Like, what in the world? I mean, Ryan, I, I know this sounds crazy, and I still can't put my finger on why it feels this way, but yeah. it feels like I was being set up to end up here. Oh, my God. I, I know that sounds bizarro. I mean, I shouldn't well, be here. I haven't done anything wrong. Right, right, but my goodness. That's... You have one minute remaining for this Uh-oh, call. Run out of time. But, but it was like everything got taken out of the house, and it's in the storage unit so that I could come to jail. <laughs> it sounds crazy, but it it yeah. really feels that way. Uh, and that's, I don't know wow. if I'm going to be like some kind of example, but when I get out of here, I have a story to tell, and I am going to try to do everything I can to protect the children because that's what's happening. Is that kids are being absolutely horribly yep. abused? Yeah, um, absolutely. And instead of the kids, anyways, it's it's a story, but when you come yeah. up with that. Yeah. Okay, so in the... Nightmare here, Janet. Nobody wants oh, the truth. Yeah. Nobody wants the truth. Nobody wants the truth because these kids... You know, I told Doug, I woke up, the spirit told yeah. me, it's all the devil. Oh. I mean, you've seen him. I mean, I've known you, what, for five years? You've watched him come at me, come at me, come at me, come at me. Mm-hmm. And you're exactly right because he knows I know what he's doing. And he uses these kids. And he uses yeah. all of us as the adults, the parents that don't hold the kids accountable. So now it's it's yeah. abusive to make a kid sleep on the floor. It's abusive, or it's abusive to, you know, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. You can't even raise your kids anymore. So what I'm saying is, you're being crucified in public opinion. Yeah. So your fear has to be super, super prepared. And the only way he's going to get prepared is if you push him and ride him. Okay, I will. I'll call him today. Yeah. He doesn't seem really animated. He seems like, you know, the pictures yeah, it, The pictures are going to yeah. destroy you. And I'm like, we didn't do that. 
We didn't do that. Those pictures we did not do. He did that to himself, yes. Did we put that on him and then he rubbed around and cut himself? Yes. But we didn't do that. This is a call from and paid for by... Ruby Denke, Purgatory Corrections. An inmate at Purgatory Correctional Facility. This call is subject to recording and monitoring. If you don't wish to talk, hang up now. Hello? Thank Hello? you for using Telmate. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear us? Yeah. What okay, that was... Over there? It's uh, 9, 9.30. We're good. Okay. At right? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. We're eight hours ahead. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad you could call us back. Yeah. I haven't used the phones very much. They're kind of hard to figure out. But, um, yeah, I think I figured out how to use... I don't think this one will shut me off. I think the one I called you was a free call, and this one will be paid for um, by my account. Kevin, okay. and I both put some money in it. <coughs> so, okay. Um, but I, I was saying I, I can't say everything that I want to say, but um, I really did feel, I really did feel like the arrest was like a rescue. Like I just felt so many angels around, and it was like a relief. It was just really kind of surreal, kind of strange. Um, but I, I just keep thinking about, you know, President Nelson's talk, you know, think celestial, and I know he said in the past about my myopic thinking, and, and he's, he's given a lot of context to, you know, how small this life really is, and I'm just so grateful how many people, you know, the, go to the grave not, not having woken up. And I just, I want to use this time, and I am using this time to, to change, to repent, and to do what I can to let the Lord know I, I love him and my family, and oh. <clears throat> I've had many experiences here to kind of guide my thinking, it's like, I don't know, my, my attorney's been really good. Did you know my attorney is... I believe that God has a hand in the old Ruby, you know, being uh, kind of set free or whatever you want to call it, um, that, you know, thing being gone. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I could not come out of this without without his grace, without his mercy, without his help. This has been the strangest and the most miraculous intervention. It, it put everybody where they needed to be. It separated me from Jody, so I'm not hearing her. And I think just being gone and not hearing her has cleared a lot of things up for me. And it put the kids in a place where You have exceeded the allowable time for this call. Goodbye. Um, did you did you see that Jody pled guilty today? I did see that. Yes, is that a relief for you? Mhm. Mm yeah, it's yeah. a big relief. It's a yeah. big relief. There, there would have been positive the other way too. Had she not pled guilty, there's enough evidence that she would have been, could have been convicted for life. But um, yeah, that would have been messy. It would have been really okay. messy, and yeah, the kids would have. So, um, 
so do you and her get the same outcome no matter what now, or is there a chance that it would be different? That's a that's a really good question. That's one that I've asked Lamar. Um, no, we can still have different outcomes. So um, Ellie asked a little bit about this. Um, I wrote it out in a text um, to her, but so the next thing that will happen is I will fill out and she will fill out a probation and um, probation and there's another P um, paperwork and basically you go through your history and you tell them your history which there's no history on me there, there's nothing yeah. no criminal history no mental health history nothing um, and I'm also hiring um, a professional to do a mental health evaluation just to say she's she's good like there's no mental health problems at all and then that will go to my probationary board Jody she can lie on her paperwork and mm -hmm. she probably will I don't think she's going to give them her history but I think in the interview it's going to be apparent that she's mentally ill mm -hmm. um, and so that will affect how long someone you know because they're looking how how repentant are you how much responsibility are you taking how mm -hmm. how are you aware that what you've done is wrong and she's not she's the only reason she pled is because she didn't want to do life and she knew I would testify um, the other thing is on my plea deal when I come up for probation the the prosecuting attorney can um, will often if they think that you're a danger to society will talk to the probationary board and and or write them a letter saying I think she needs to stay where she is um, he's going to stay neutral and not write any letter when my probation comes up which is a really big deal but for okay. her he's he's not going to stay neutral so uh -huh. we can come up to probation and I can get off on probation and she may not so what does probation look like like what does that all entail it can look like several different things I think I'm still learning about this and I think it's I never realized how complicated it is I always thought you pled oh, guilty the and they tell you how long you're in yeah there's a lot of terminology to know yeah yeah and and you know half of the stuff that is said goes over my head and then I have to go you know I come back and I ask the girls here I'm like what does this mean what does this yeah. mean um, but probation could look like going home like you could go home sometimes mm -hmm. um, you know it, it might look like going home with with restrictions like you can go home but you need to live with somebody who's responsible and you can't be around certain people like they may say you could go home if your parents agree to house you but you can't go home to where your kids are living it could look yeah. like something like that okay. or it could look like something where I have an ankle monitor or it could look like you can go home if you pay a ten thousand dollar fine or maybe it could look like um, instead of serving the rest of your time we'll give you some good time and you can go home in half the time or so I, I think that you probation getting off on probation I think looks like there's several different ways that that could happen oh, I see that's good to know yeah and is that usually after you've already served some time then say, say that one more time that's after you have served some time yeah yeah and I don't know what 
that is going to be. I don't know if it's one of the girls said that it would be for me six months, but I've also heard it could be four years. And some people serve several years before they ever see their probation board. So okay. I'm, I'm really still, I mean, I could be in there four years. I could be in there 30. Like, I really don't know. Yeah. And that will come in February? Mm-hmm, on February 20th. Okay. Yeah. And um, the news that I saw today, Jody's um, sentence hearing is also February 20th. So I'm going to make a request that we be transferred in two different vans. I don't think they're going to accommodate that. Oh, um, do they? Okay, I see. Yeah, when we so when I went to the courthouse last week, what they do, and I and I they did this when they transported me to Utah County as well. They pull all the girls. There's only two housing here for girls. There's not very many girls here, but there's okay. many for the men. And so they take the girls and they put them in a cell together, in a holding cell, to wait. And then they get all the men together and they put all the men in the cells. And then they start putting on the ankle bracelets and the chains and the mm-hmm. everything on the men while you're. So you're sitting in the cell with these women you're going to the court with for an hour. And you're sitting with them. And then they pull the girls out and they line you up and then they put the shackles on you and then they take the men out to the van, the men's van, and then they they take the women out to the women's van. And then you drive to the courthouse together and then they take you out. How far away is your place from the courthouse there in St. George? um, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. Okay. Okay. And... um, And then you sit in a cell at the court. So if someone's hearings at 9, this is what happened to me. There was a girl that went with me, and her hearing was at 9, but mine wasn't until 11. So she went in, and she had like a five-minute hearing. And then we sat in the cell and talked for two hours until it was my turn. And then we rode back together. So you you pretty much spend several hours together, whoever's going to the court that day with you. Interesting. So that means on February 20th, it would be you and her going together. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When was the last thing you talked to her? Was it that day? Mm-hmm. It was when we were arrested. Okay. Yeah. I went, I left early in the morning to go to a dentist appointment with Julie. We left at like 3 in the morning and she calls me sometime in the morning and I and so I went back down but when I got to the house I mean it it looked like it looked like the movies there was a red fire truck there was a black van with tinted windows there was there were two ambulances there were 20 cop cars I mean, it was, it was. Did you just sit in your car? No, I, I pulled up and found a spot to park. She lives on a cul-de-sac. I parked in the cul-de-sac and I walked up and the, the driveway was just full of cops and I just walked up to the cops and mm. they said, they said, are you the mother? And I nodded my head, and so they took me in and put me in the casita, and I sat there for a couple hours. I just sat there, and then um, they, they were finishing looking through the house and stuff, I think, and um, some of the guys were coming in and out with pizza, and so I think... I think Eve was still there because the ambulance car was there. I was eating pizza with the police. And then, um, and then once, once the kids were taken in the ambulance cars, then the detective came and 
patted me down and arrested me and then took me to the courthouse for questioning, which I didn't. And I'm glad I didn't say anything because Lamar was really helpful. Like, if you ever get arrested, don't say anything. I just didn't say anything. And she How was did like, you find Lamar? Did he, was he just assigned to you, coincidentally, or did you... Um, so she has a... She has an attorney that she's used for connections, and mm-hmm. and I called him, and no one answered, but then she called him, and he said, I only do, like, business law. I don't do criminal law, but here's a number of two people who do that I would highly recommend, and so she gave the two numbers, and I got the number from Kevin. I don't, I don't know how the numbers got from... I don't know how, but um, that he Kevin said, "Here's your attorney, and this is her attorney." And so, and that was the last time I talked to Kevin. It was a couple of days after my arrest. But so I didn't see Jody at all when I went to the house to turn myself in. I didn't see her. Okay. And and I went. And they took me to the courthouse, and the detective was like, "I've got all night. We can talk all night." And I didn't say anything. I just said, I, I want an attorney. So uh, I could hear Kevin in the hallway talking, and then he left. And when they took me out of the room, they took me outside and cuffed me and, and said, again, they cuffed me again, and then put me, they told me you're under arrest for, and then they told me two two of the charges and then they had me get in the in the patrol car and that's when I saw Jody. I saw Jody was also in the patrol car. And um she she had surgery on her shoulder and she couldn't put her hands behind her back so then they pulled her out and changed up the way they arrested her so she could drive with her hands in front of her. And then we had about a forty minute 45 minute drive to the jail and that was the last time I spoke to her we were in the back and um, we didn't say a whole lot Um, Mm -hmm. I mean we talked the whole time but I don't remember really saying a whole lot we sang a hunk like hummed a couple of hymns and she she was she was still justifying the whole time she was like don't worry don't worry we'll have our day in court and then and then when we were booked in um, they put us in separate cells and we've been in separate cells ever since so okay. Do you hate talking about that kind of stuff? Does it trigger anything, or do you, or is it just? No, I don't. I I think it's. Mind. No, I don't mind talking about it. It's okay. Maybe good for me to talk about. It. I don't know if you <laughs> will like no, talking I mean, about it. I was just wondering if it triggered anything. In the, but yeah. if you're doing okay mentally, and then that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's um I think the I think putting the pieces together and just seeing like she knew she was lying the whole time like I it and it's embarrassing too to like repeat it. It's like, "Oh my gosh, how gullible was I? Oh my gosh, how how much power I gave this person and I didn't see it." But when I realized, so so she had, her attorney's name is Doug, Terry, and mine's Lamar. And, and Lamar, you know, maybe a month into it, he's maybe not even that long, he's like, Jody denies everything. She denies having anything to do with this. And I was shocked. I was like, what? Wow. And I'm I'm still telling Lamar, like, you know, all, all of the justifications and all of this you know I'm talking like a criminal I sound like a mad person 
he was so patient yeah. with me. He was so patient with me. He would just look at me and like kind of dumbfounded, like like I'd said two plus two is seven, and I really believed it. And he would just stare at me. I'm like, what am I saying that's so off? And um, <laughs> but but that's because I really believed it. But but then when I heard that Jody was not talking like that she was denying the whole thing it told me she knew all along it's like it's like a little kid who doesn't know it's wrong to pee in their underwear like they don't know they're not embarrassed by it it's like oh oh I was supposed to pee in the toilet oh oh oops but you get a six year old (laughs) you know you get a six year old who knows they're supposed to pee in the toilet and they're peeing down the heater vent they're going to try to hide it Mm-hmm. And that's when I realized she knew, she knew all along, and she's hiding it. And then I was like, crap, what What am I saying? And that's when things kind of started turning. I was like, she was, she's not been honest. I didn't, I didn't know she wasn't honest. I didn't know she would lie. And then it's like, what else has she been lying about? Where else are, have I been deceived? Mm-hmm. What was that? Oh, no, I was just, yeah, agreeing. Yeah. You, you didn't see it. Yeah. Yeah, and it was just like this, the little string that started pulling apart this fabric. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my gosh, what have I done? Like, what? Well, I can talk about Lamar, it now. Yeah, go good. ahead. Lamar was just very very kind that day that we met with him. It was a very oh. kind time to visit with us. Oh, like miraculous. He, he liked, liked, yeah, yeah. He and his wife. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he had us. he had a way of like he he didn't beat around the bush. Like there were some times he would say things that were shocking to me. Like he he would like repeat what I said, but he would say it in a different tone so I could hear myself. And he's like, is that really what you think? And I'm like, oh. And he would, but then there were other times that. You have one minute remaining for this call. Do you, do you want to end the call or do you want me to call you back? How do you want to? Um, we can end for today and then we'll, okay. we can always talk again. So, yeah, I'm just really glad that he's got your that he's there to kind of help you through it and. Mhm. Yeah. yeah. Well, that first night I was in the jail, it, I just felt really strongly like I'm sending you help. Help is coming. Yeah. And I just yeah. felt like that was that was Lamar, and he's been very very helpful. I'm grateful yeah. for him. Well, that's what we've all been praying for this whole time. So I'm mm-hmm. glad that even it's, it's a different kind of help, but I'm glad it's finally here. Me too. Me too. I'll take it. Like, I, I hate this, but I'll, I'm taking it. Of course. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Um, it was good to talk to you. You have exceeded the allowable time for this call. Goodbye. This is a call from and paid for by... Jody Hildebrandt. An inmate at Purgatory Correctional Facility. This call is subject to recording and monitoring. If you don't wish to talk, hang up now. Thank you for using Telmate. Are you there? Yep, there you are. Okay, yeah. Okay, so the Lord says that first they'll lay their hands on you and, and persecute you delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought right. before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And yeah. it shall turn to you for a testimony. And then he says, Settle it therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what ye shall answer, for I will give you a mouth and, and wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay or ner- or resist. And you know what gainsay <laughs> means? Wow. So then, then he says, And ye shall be betrayed by both parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends. I'm like, <laughs> oh my gosh, that's exactly what's going on. 
and some of you shall be caused to be put to death, and you shall be hated for, by all men for my name's sake. And then he goes on yeah. to say, you know, and I never read that before, but like I've never been in prison, but I just read that. Yeah. I just wept. I mean, the spirit was like, he just said, this is you. So yeah. I read, Good. I read in Mark, so that was in, that was in um, Luke, and I read in Mark the same kind of thing, you know, because the the Gospels, they, they wrote similarly. Um, so he said, Now the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father the son, like the father yeah. will betray the son, and the children shall rise up against their parents and shall cause them to be put to death. That statement right there is what's going on with me. The yeah. children shall rise up and put their parents to death, and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Oh my yeah. I just, I mean, I, I probably cried for an hour straight. Just everything clicked, and I said, wow. I'm happy to go to prison. Because <laughs> if, if you if you continue to read the rest of the of the chapter, he's like, uh-huh. be be grateful. If you're in this situation, be grateful because you're be you're grateful. Alive. And wow. you will be saved. And wow. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a quite experience to read that from, from your yeah. perspective right now. You know, wow. Well, I have just been begging him, like, you've got to explain this to me. Like, I cannot logically figure out what's going on here. And huh. and that's it. That's what's going on in the spirit. Yeah. I mean, I just was... I, when I feel the spirit, I have two physiological reactions. I get really um, like shaky, like I'm like I'm shivering, like I'm cold, or I feel uh-huh. heat, like I have a fever run through me. Yeah. Wow. I was, I was like burning up. It felt like I was burning up, and I was just yeah. shaking with gratitude. Like here's wow. your, here's your answer. Here's what this yeah. is. That's super cool. And it, That's pretty neat. How, how but, that, pretty neat how that works, how the scriptures can do that, you know? Yeah. That's yeah. Cool. Well, I have, like I said, I have probably every single day just been, you know, trying to logic, trying to understand, oh, yeah. trying to be humble, and trying to say, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. What's happening? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're, you're living a puzzle, trying to put the pieces together. Yeah. Just. Yeah. yeah. And in um in Peter, First Peter, I don't have this one written down. I, I kind of wrote wrote the other stuff down, so I took it down to the phone. But in First Peter, chapter four, um, between verses twelve and nineteen, I can't remember exactly how he says it, but he's like. When you have something happen to you and it just feels like it's random, it's not random. Like, like this is intentional. <laughs> like, you're, like, like you, you're, you, it's not just some crazy act of events that's going on. This is like intentional. And yeah. that First Peter chapter four was another one of the um, footnotes to refer to. You know, that reinforced all this other stuff. And I'm like, oh, wow. this is just some crazy random event. As purpose, for just right. and then I connected it to my blessing because my blessing I've been reading like several times a day, and the blessing is pretty, pretty clear. The, my first, the first paragraph of it says, you know, these are words directly to you from your heavenly Father, and according to your faith and diligence, um, you'll they'll either be a comfort to you or, or they won't be. You know, so however much diligence and faith you want to put in. And then the next yeah. paragraph talks about um, it says you are a special spirit chosen and reserved for these last days and sent forth to the earth in great clouds of glory to share the gospel and prepare the people for the return of the Savior. Yeah. And, it, and then it says um, one of the reasons you were sent here is to share the gospel. The strongest message you will ever teach is the power of your example. And then he says, through the power of your example and the spoken word, or no, he says, um, your tongue will be loosed and you will be able to teach the gospel in far and distant nations. And 
then he says, no, through, the, through, the, through the power of your example and the spoken word, you will be a great tool in the hand of the Lord in teaching the gospel to many. So the whole paragraph about an example, an example, an example, I'm like, well, what's a better example than to go to prison unjustly <laughs> and then go yeah. teach the gospel? Go teach the gospel. Yeah. Like, like, plan on doing yeah. Yeah, and that, I mean, that's super cool, that lady that's, that's Jewish that you've met, and, yeah. you know, what a, what a neat thing. Yeah. Be able to share with her. And Begging God, like, please help me understand why I'm in this. Like, this doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Today. And he, he gave me some information yesterday, and then and then today really sealed it with some scriptures that... Um, um, I'd love to share it with you. Yeah, go ahead. You got it there. I'm reading the Articles of Faith by Talmadge. This is an excellent book. Oh, uh-huh. I think every, yep. everybody should read this book. <laughs> yep, I've, I've read that one. That's yeah. pretty pretty deep read in some regards. It is. It hits all the principles, you know, with yeah. a lot of clarity. So. I've got a woman yeah. that's um, interested in the church, so I've been reading some of this to her as well. So she's oh, cool. a Jew, and her, both her parents are from Jerusalem. So, really? Yeah. And she's like, oh, that's cool. I, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, and it's great. So this book is really helpful. Wow, that's neat. I like the Bible and the book at the same time. <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> so, yeah. So... There's there you section. Go. He's talking about uh-huh. talking about the second coming, and you know I'm coming from this place of I was just getting ready to move, and all of a sudden I ended up in prison. You know, like what, what the world? Yeah. And um, you know, one day you'll know all the details, and they'll, they'll all make sense. But if I could talk right. about it here, um, <laughs> right. But, um, it was the Lord talking to the disciples. They asked him, like, um, when shall these things be? Like, when, when are these things going to come to pass? And so he starts talking right. about the last days. And he, he says, you know, that nation shall war against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. But, and then he goes, but before all the, these that he just talked about, they uh-huh. shall lay their hands on you. Now, I have been praying for five months, like, explain this to me, like, what is going on? Like, I'm willing to go there, but please let me go right side up. Like, like yeah. if you want me to be there because you want me to be there, then then great, great. I will not resist it at all, but please help me understand. So I read this this morning, and I just wept and wept and just thanked him and thanked him and thanked him because it just all wow. click, 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 click. So he says, but wow. before all these things, you know, nation rising against nation, they shall lay yeah. their hands on you. And I'm like, <laughs> like, oh, my goodness. And prosecute you. You have one minute remaining for this call. Back. Yep, call me back. Did you hear that? Okay. <laughs> yeah, call me back. This report in the Washington State Council Session. You know, John J. Walton presiding. You may be seated. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to District Court. We're here for sentencing in the matter of State of Utah versus Ruby Frankie. Ms. Frankie is here with Mr. Winward. Mr. Clark and Mr. Shom are here for the State of Utah. And we are ready to proceed with sentencing. We are. Yes, Your Honor. Counsel, the terms of the sentence were agreed to as part of the plea agreement, correct? That is correct. There is a pre-sentence investigation report in the matter. I have reviewed that. Everyone has seen it? Yes. What about restitution, counsel, before we move on with other matters? We'd like to leave that open at this time, Your Honor. Um, the I, I can get into that. I might be more comfortable if we approach to get into that. Is there an agreement that restitution that uh, we reserve that and for what period of time? Eight months is what we're anticipating. But but I I haven't talked to to the defendant's counsel about that. We haven't discussed that, Your Honor. Is there any objection? No. All right. 
what's the state's position regarding sentencing? Your Honor, the state... I'll stand up. The state respectfully requests that the court sentence Ms. Frankie to consecutive prison terms for each of the four counts of aggravated child abuse. This sentence was agreed to by Ms. Frankie in her plea agreement and is also recommended by adult probation and parole. She committed horrible acts of child abuse. From May to August in 2023, Ms. Frankie and her business partner held her two children, ages 9 and 11, turning 12, in a concentration camp-like setting. The children were regularly denied food, water, beds to sleep in, and virtually all forms of entertainment. They were isolated from others and were hidden when people came to visit the house where the children and the defendants were staying. The children were forced to do physical tasks, like carrying loaded boxes up and down stairs and wall sits or sitting against a wall without a chair or a stool for hours at a time. They were also forced to do manual labor outdoors in the extreme summer heat, at times without shoes or socks. They were forced to stand outside on a cement patio in the summer heat for hours and even days at a time. They were beaten and the 12 year old was regularly bound hand and foot after he attempted to run away in mid-July. Both children had extensive physical injuries from the abuse that required hospitalization when they were found. The injuries from the binding to the 12 year old are particularly awful. In addition to physical abuse, the children were emotionally abused to the extent that each believed to some degree that they deserved what was being done to them. Had the older of the children not had the courage to run away and ask a neighbor to call the police, heaven only knows how much longer he could have survived in that situation. After being caught, Ms. Frankie has shown considerable remorse as evidenced by agreeing to serve consecutive prison terms and being willing to cooperate with the state against Ms. Hildebrandt. However, given the severity of the abuse she inflicted, consecutive terms are appropriate in this case. As the court's aware, section 76.3.401 lays out factors the court takes into account in determining whether consecutive or concurrent sentences should be imposed. Those factors are the gravity and circumstances of the offense, the number of victims, and the history, character, and rehabilitative needs of the defendant. As agreed to in the plea agreement and as recommended by adult probation and parole, consecutive sentences are appropriate. This is due to the severity of the abuse to both victims. It could be argued that Ms. Frankie should receive a lesser sentence than Ms. Hildebrandt because of her remorse and willingness to cooperate with the state. However, the Board of Pardons and Parole will have broad latitude and will be able to take those facts into account when it determines how long each of the co-defendants will remain incarcerated. In conclusion, we respectfully request that the court go along with what was agreed to in the plea agreement and is recommended by adult probation and parole and impose consecutive sentences. Thank you. Anything else from the state? No, Your Honor. Mr. Winward? Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. In my few comments this morning and in the comments my client wishes to make in a few minutes, we are not suggesting nor are we asking that the court deviate from the stipulated sentence contained in the written plea agreement. I want the court to know that through introspection and reflection, Ruby Frankie has become a serious student of her own actions. In the very early days of my involvement with Ruby, she was somewhat defensive and she was still very much indoctrinated into a philosophy that was destructive. Fortunately, Ruby came to the stark realization of the errors in her thinking patterns and subsequent actions. To say that she was horrified by this realization would be to put it mildly. I have marveled at how quickly Ruby abandoned her defensive stance and moved toward her total acceptance of her actions and to her sentence today. So far, she has used her time in jail to unwrap the layers upon layers of deceit and deception foisted upon her over the last four years by an unscrupulous individual. Ruby realizes that she still has work to do in shedding those thinking errors and to reestablish a better and correct pattern of thinking and behavior. Ruby realizes that changing her thinking, reestablishing relationships, and healing are not simple or easy tasks. However, she is committed to doing that work. 
I would like the court to know that Ruby Frankie is a delightful, respectful, and responsible person. She is open to feedback and addressing the consequences of her actions head on, and now ready to address your honor and accept your judgment. Thank you, Judge Walton. Thank you. Ms. Frankie has a statement she'd like to make. She does. Thank you. Judge you Walton. You don't have to bend down the. Okay. Thank you. I would like to make a statement without any intent to change my stipulated sentence. For the past four years, I've chosen to follow counsel and guidance that has led me into a dark delusion. My distorted version of reality went largely unchecked as I would isolate from anyone who challenged me. I was led to believe that this world was an evil place filled with cops who control, hospitals that injure, government agencies that brainwash, church leaders who lie in lust, husbands who refuse to protect, and children who need abused. My choice to believe and behave this paranoia culminated into criminal activity for which I stand before you today ready to take accountability. Jody Hildebrandt was never my business partner, nor was I ever employed by her. I have never received wages from her or connections. Jody was employed as my son's counselor in 2019, and in 2020, I paid her to be my mentor. It is important to me to demonstrate my remorse and regret without blame. I take full accountability for my choices, and it is my preference that I serve a prison sentence. Thank you to the officers in Santa Clara and the Ivan City Police. Nick Hellman, Brian Palufo, Cy Pikivit, Mike Pondoyo in Tobler, John Ward, D. Lewis, and Chief Flowers. You were the angels who came and saved my children. I especially want to thank Detective Jay Bate. She plucked me out of a situation I didn't know how to get out of. And the moment she handcuffed me was the moment I gained my freedom. You were not the controlling ones. I was. Thank you to the medical staff at Intermountain Hospital. Your skill, tenderness, and professionalism helped heal my children. Jody and I inflicted the injuries, not the hospital. Thank you to DCFS, the Children's Justice Center, Judge Basil, and other key adults. You've gathered my children under your wing and offered them love, compassion, encouragement. You were not the ones who were doing the brainwashing. Thank you to my Bishop Tom Hawks and my state president, Jim Nelson, for reminding me of the Lord's love for the lost. So much pain and suffering would have been avoided had I followed and heeded your counsel. I was the one who was deceived, not you. Thank you to the Washington County Prosecutor's Office, Ryan Shaw, the legal assistants and discovery clerks. Eric Clark, you exemplified to me how justice and mercy are meant to coexist. My charges are just. They offer safety to my family, accountability to the public, and they did show mercy to me. Thank you to my attorney, Lamar Winward, and his staff, I would not be where I am today without them. Thank you to Randy Kester for your limitless energy in healing my family. My dear friends, Pam and Roy, I'm so sorry for letting you down. Because of your association with me, your innocence was called into question. My mother-in-law, father-in-law, Kevin's family, my cousins, aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, and neighbors, you all saw the warning signs long before I did, and you did what you could. You wanted to help, but I pushed you away. My mother and father, I have been utterly wretched to you. You have offered me unconditional love, 
and for that I have offered you unconditional contempt. My siblings and their spouses, because of my decision to roll around in a pigsty, I've drug your families through the mud in public. Yet, when I desired to return as a prodigal sister, unlike the prodigal's brother in the Bible, you synced step with my parents and ran out to greet me. Your capacity to love is unprecedented. Kevin, my husband of more than 23 years, you are the love of my life. I'm so sorry to leave to you to finish what we both started together. The ending of our marriage is a tragedy. And you are wrapped around my heart in a knot I'll never be able to undo. To my babies, my six little chicks, you are part of me. I was the mama duck who was consistently waddling you to safety. I can see now that over the past four years, I was in a deep undercurrent that led us to danger. I would never have led you to darkness knowingly. I was so disoriented that I believed dark was light and right was wrong. I would do anything in this world for you. My willingness to sacrifice all for you was masterfully manipulated into something very ugly. I took from you all that was soft and safe and good. I took from you your mother. How terrifying this must have been for you. I will never stop crying for hurting your tender souls. You are you so precious to me. I'm sorry. My choice to live in fear of the world has created a great vulnerability and a blind spot for me where I have broken hearts and I've caused people to suffer and I have betrayed sacred trust. Watching my community respond to my charges with justice and mercy and grace and love is all the more evidence to me of how wrong I've been. This world is full of really good people. And finally, I'm sorry for twisting God's word and distorting his doctrines. My greatest desire is to stand in his court someday spotless and confident. And Judge Walton, I know that standing before you today is a necessary step towards that end. Thank you to you and your staff for facilitating my opportunity to take accountability and to answer for my charges. I am humbled and willing to serve a prison, a prison sentence as long as it takes to continue unraveling all of the misinformation I have believed and bought, swallowed and acted out, and for my family to heal and for the community to heal. And I understand this is going to take time. I'm committed to continuing my learning until all of my toxic layers are shed and I am ready to re-enter as a contributing member of our beautiful society. Thank you, Judge Walton. Thank you for your statement, Ms. Frankie. Anything else, Mr. Winward? No, Your Honor. Anything else prior to the court imposing sentence? No, Your Honor. The sentence will be that Ms. Frankie serve four counts, four one to 15 year sentences based on her convictions for four counts of aggravated child abuse. Again, they will serve consecutively, be served consecutively pursuant to the party's agreement and the applicable statute. Under the applicable statute, the court finds that, a cons that consecutive sentences are appropriate. Ms. Frankie, the last thing I do need to tell you 
is that you have only 30 days to file or to perfect an appeal of any errors of the court by filing a written notice of appeal with the clerk of the court. If you don't do that within 30 days, you will lose your right to appeal. You also have the right to the assistance of an attorney on appeal and to have one appointed if you cannot afford to hire your own. Restitution, as agreed by the parties, will remain open for a period of eight months. Any of the parties can bring that matter back before the court within that, that period of time. Anything else? No, Your Honor. Your Honor. Thank, Thank you. you. The next matter before the court is State of Utah v. Hildebrandt, case 23150763. Mr. Terry is here representing Ms. Hildebrandt. Mr. Shum and Mr. Clark are here representing the state. Your Honor, we anticipated 10.30. I'm not saying that we need to wait till then, but can I have a moment, please? Approach, please. All rise. Court is back in session. You may be seated. Court recalls the matter of State of Utah v. Hildebrandt, case 23150763. Counsel are present. Ms. Hildebrandt is present. Counsel, there is a pre-sentence investigation report. I have read it. Everyone has seen and reviewed that. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Again, the sentence was stipulated at the time of the plea agreement. What record do we need to make other than going forward with sentencing? Your Honor, it would be repetitive. So I had the same statement just with the last few paragraphs where I was differentiating between Ms. Frank and Ms. Hildebrandt. Okay, let's talk about housekeeping matters first. What about restitution? We stipulated to keep that open for eight months. It is appropriate, Your Honor, since we don't have any evidence with respect to restitution, and that's because it is still in the process of being gathered by the county attorney's office. It's completely appropriate for the court to make no orders with respect to restitution other than to reserve all issues regarding restitution, and we have no issue with the eight-month time frame. And the injunction that was previously issued by the court will remain in effect? It will. At least until that time? It will remain in effect until further order of this court. All right. Mr. Clark? Thanks, Your Honor. The State of Utah respectfully requests that the court sentence Ms. Hildebrandt to consecutive prison terms for each of the four counts of aggravated child abuse to which she has pleaded guilty. The sentence was agreed to her in her plea agreement and is also recommended by adult probation and parole. Ms. Hildebrandt committed awful acts of child abuse. From May to August 2023, she and her business partner held two children, ages 9 and 11, turning 12, in a concentration camp-like setting in her house in Ivan City. The children were regularly denied food, water, beds to sleep in, and virtually all forms of entertainment. They were isolated from others and were hidden when people came to visit the house. They were forced to do physical tasks like carrying loaded boxes up and down stairs and doing wall sits or sitting against a wall without assistance of a chair or stool for hours at a time. They were forced to do manual labor outdoors in the extreme summer heat, often without shoes or socks. They were also forced to stand outside on a cement patio in the summer heat for hours and even days. They were beaten, and the 12-year-old was regularly bound hand and foot after he attempted to run away in mid-July. Both children had extensive physical injuries from the abuse that required hospitalization to treat. The injuries from the binding are particularly bad. In addition to the physical abuse, the children were emotionally abused. They each believed to some degree that they deserved what was being done to them. Had the older of the two children not had the courage to run away and ask a neighbor to call the police, heaven only knows how much longer he could have survived. After being caught, Ms. Hildebrandt has shown little to no remorse for her actions. In telephone conversations, 
that will be provided in full to the Board of Pardons and Parole, and which she knew to be recorded, she has repeatedly claimed that she is the victim and the children of the perpetrators. She has gone so far as to say that the things said in this proceeding and covered by the media today will be full of lies. The combination of three factors make Ms. Hildebrand a significant threat to the community. First, the severity of the abuse she caused to be inflicted on young children. Second, her attitude that everything she did was justified and that she is being wrongfully imprisoned. And third, her training as a therapist and aptitude for using online resources to convince others to follow her guidance. Utah Code Section 76-3401 lays out three factors the court should consider in determining whether to impose concurrent or consecutive sentences. The first is the gravity and circumstances of the offense. The second is the number of victims. And the third is the history, character, and rehabilitative need of the defendant. As agreed to in the plea agreement and as recommended by adult probation and parole, consecutive sentences are appropriate here. This is due to the severity of the abuse to the two victims and the extreme need for Ms. Hildebrandt to be rehabilitated so that she no longer will present a risk to the community. The state respectfully requests that she be sentenced to four consecutive terms. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Mr. Terry? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I will be brief. As is always the case in cases that come before courts, there are two sides to every case. And as, um, and even in a case like this, that remains the case. Um, there are many, many allegations regarding these two individuals, Miss um, Frankie and my client, Miss Hildebrand. The only facts in this case that are adjudicated facts are those set forth in the plea agreement that she entered into, that she entered into freely and knowingly and voluntarily. Those facts, those adjudicated facts, are significant. They certainly provide a basis for the pleas and provide a basis for the stipulated sentence in this case. My experience with Ms. Hildebrandt is that she is not the person that she has been portrayed to be. But having said that, she has accepted responsibility in this case. She has entered into this plea agreement with a stipulated sentence of four consecutive uh, sentences. She did that at the time she entered into the plea agreement knowing that that would be the court's order. She is before the court today knowing that that will be the court's order and she fully accepts that. She accepts responsibility and she accepts the consequences for her conduct. Um, and we will submit it to the court on the stipulated agreement. Mr. Terry, you suggested that there, there are two sides to every case. I generally agree with you. Ms. Hildebrand didn't make a statement to AP&P in, in the course of the pre-sentence investigation report. Correct. Why did she not make a, make a statement? She wanted to reserve her right to make a statement before the court today, and she has a brief statement that she wants to read, Your Honor. Okay. And, and All right. I, Ms. Hildebrand? Go ahead. I sincerely love these children. I desire for them to heal physically and emotionally. One of the reasons I did not go to trial is that I did not want them to emotionally relive the experience which would have been detrimental to them. My hope and prayer is that they will heal and move forward to have beautiful lives. I am willing to submit to what the state feels would be an appropriate amount of time served to make restitution as an outcome. And in answer to your question, Your Honor, I knew that whatever she might say to the author of the pre-sentence report would probably be sound uh, hollow or, and self-serving, and perhaps it does today. But I know that my client, in the statement that she makes to the court today, that, that, that that statement is absolutely 
sincere. Not just Ms. Hildebrandt recognize that it's her behavior that that caused the harm to the children that she's referred to in her statement? Your Honor, she recognizes that she was, along with Miss Frankie, um, that, that she made decisions with respect to the discipline of those children that were wrong, that caused harm to those children. She fully recognizes that and accepts responsibility for that. All right. Anything else? No, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. Okay. Ms. Hildebrandt, this, this circumstance is tragic. It's largely, of course, of your making. By any measure, your conduct in this case was disastrous for these children. Adults are supposed to protect children. Adults with specialized training in particular are supposed to protect children. You didn't do that in this case. In this, in this case, you terrorized children, and the results have been tragic. It's what happened to these children and your philosophy in dealing with them frankly seems detached from reality or any objective standard of decency or, or even common sense. And the court finds that it is appropriate that you serve a prison sentence. The court finds under the statute, Utah Code 76-3-401, that given the gravity and circumstances of the offenses, the number of victims and the history and character and needs of the defendant that consecutive sentences are appropriate, the court imposes four one to 15 year sentences to be again served consecutively for each of the four counts of aggravated child abuse. The last thing I do need to tell you is that you only have 30 days to file or perfect an appeal of any error of the court by filing a written notice of appeal with the clerk of the court. If you don't do that, you will lose your right to appeal. That has to be filed in writing and again within 30 days. You also have the right to the assistance of an attorney and to have an attorney appointed if you cannot afford to hire your own. Thank you. We're in recess. Thank you, Your Honor. Thanks, Your Honor.